Thank you, Chair. We're now live on YouTube. When you're ready, would you like to start the meeting? Thank you, Wendy. Yeah, good morning and welcome to East Devon District Council's um, Virtual Planning Committee meeting mm, on the 19th of January 2022. I'm your Chair, Councillor Eileen Rag. Based on the decision of the Council to continue virtual meetings until the 11th of May this year, I would like to remind both members and public attending or watching that this Council has delegated much of its decision-making power to our senior officers. We will continue to adhere as closely as possible to the procedure rules detailed in our Constitution. In the event of a break in the internet connection, please bear with us as we try to reconnect. After 15 minutes, if we are not able to reconnect, we will consider the meeting adjourned and reconvene at a later date. If you wish to comment, please raise your electronic hands and wait to be called. Any members of the public can view the agenda by visiting our website at www.eastdevon.gov.uk. We will now start the meeting by doing a roll call of committee members here present. Over to you, Wendy, to do the roll call, please. Thank you, Chair. I'll start with you, Councillor Rag. Yeah, present. Vice Chair, Councillor Chamberlain. Present. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Bloxham. Present. Thank you. Councillor Brown? Present. Councillor Coleman? Present. Thanks. Councillor Davy? Present. Thank you. Councillor Tisserum? Present. Thank you, Wendy. Councillor Gazard? Present. Thank you, Wendy. Councillor Howe? Present. <coughs> Councillor Key? Present, Wendy. Councillor Lawrence? Present. Thank you, Wendy. Councillor Pook? Councillor Pratt? Present, thank you. Councillor Skinner? Present, thank you, Wendy. Councillor Woodward? Present, thank you. Thank you. Um, Chair, we are called for today's meeting. Thank you, Wendy. Uh, agenda item one, <clears throat> the running order for today's meeting and the speakers list can be viewed under agenda item one on pages five to six. Item two, minutes of the consultative meeting held on 15th of December, 2021, pages seven to 12. If anyone has a comment on these minutes, please raise your electronic hand. If there are no raised hands, I'll take this as an indication that you're happy with the minutes so are noted. No electronic hands raised. So uh, item three, apologies. Over to you, Wendy. Yes, we have two apologies, Councillor Pook and Councillor Whibley. Thank you. Uh, agenda item four, declarations of interest. Um, Wendy, can you do the roll call for that, please? Yes, so members, um, when I call your name, if you could just let me know the item number, what type of interest you are declaring um, and why you are declaring that interest. So I'll start with you, Chair. Councillor Rag. Um, I don't think so, but if it comes up, I will. I've, I, I get lots of emails. It's, you know, they get a bit um, mixed at some time. Um, but if it, if it does come up, I'll raise it then. Okay. Okay, thank you. Councillor Chamberlain. Good morning. Thank you, Wendy. Um, just item 10, just to note that I'm the ward member um, for Broadcliffe, that's all. <coughs> thank you. Councillor Bloxham. None, thank you. Thank you. Councillor Brown. Uh, none, thank you, except for um, 21 stroke 2641, um, the one in Honiton. Um, the applicant used to come into the hotel at times when I had it, but that's, you know, sort of two years or more ago. Thank you. Councillor Coleman. Yeah, none except I'm on the extra town planning committee. Thank you. Councillor Davey. 
Done. Thank you, Wendy. Councillor de Serum. There are no items which I have interest, um, but I do point out that when we look at 20, the first item of 21 stroke 0891 full, um, if I've read it correctly, it says notice has now been served on East Devon District Council as the landowner of the Esplanade. So obviously as a district council, um, I duly note that uh, I have a, a minor interest in that just in, as a technicality, but obviously not, not related to my ward or anything like that. Thank you, Wendy. Thank you. Councillor Howe. None at this time, apart from the one that Councillor de Sarum has just made. Thank you. Councillor Key. None, Wendy. <coughs> Councillor Lawrence. None, thank you, Wendy, other than the one Councillor de Sarum mentioned. Thank you. Nine, thank uh -huh. you. Councillor Pratt. Uh, none, Wendy, other than the uh, matter referred to by Councillor de Sarum. Councillor Skinner. Uh, yes, please. Um, obviously, I have uh, the 2123COU, which is the vaccination centre at Greendale Business Park. I shall be declaring a personal interest on that with my uh, friendship with the um, owners of that park. And I shall be um, leaving the meeting hopefully put into the sin bin room or whatever you call it. And uh, I will not be debating and I will not be voting. And I was hoping if I could get some clarification from you, Chair. I, th I think in the running order, it was last, which is hopefully, if I can, if it is still last, I can leave the meeting at the end. But has the running order slightly changed? I'm trying to catch up with it. Uh, let me have a look. It's when second. You... It's yeah, second. second. Oh. Yeah. Oh, I'll have to bear through that then. I thought I was going to go early. That's my get out of jail free card. So other than that one, no, that's um, that's fine. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Thank you. And finally, Councillor Woodward. Uh, none. Thank you, Wendy. Thank you. Back to you, Chair. Thank Sorry, you, Chair. Sorry, Chair. I, I thought um, Councillor Gazard was missed out in that oh. um, list. Correct me if I'm wrong, Councillor Gazard. That's correct. Am I? Yeah. Oh, I'm, I'm very sorry, Councillor Gazard. Um, that's all right. I know I'm easy to miss. Um, <laughs> yes, I, I haven't got anything except as what a lot of other councillors said, as per Bruce de Sarum's comments and, and others, Chair. Thank you, Councillor Gazard. Apologies. And that's all right. Thank you, Wendy. Um, agenda item five then, uh, matters of urgency. There are no matters of urgency to discuss. Six, confidential exempt items, there are none. Uh, now we go on to the planning appeals statistics, pages 13 to 24. An update from Mr Rose, please. Thank you, Chair. Morning, everybody. Yeah, so just two, uh, two decisions on this agenda. Uh, the one relates to uh, a listed building um, in Harkham, where the inspector agreed with us that there was uh, harm to the setting and features of the listed building, so dismissed that appeal. And the second one in Exmouth, where, again, the inspector agreed with us in concerns in relation to um, uh, design, uh, impact on amenity and flood risk. Um, just, just one uh, additional point, because uh, I'm not sure I've updated members on the latest of this yet, but members may recall the application that we had at the cattle market in Honiton by oh, Churchill yeah. Developments. Um, that we, we refused <coughs> that application on a number of grounds. It went to an inquiry. The inspector dealt with that inquiry and the appeal was dismissed, but uh, the applicant challenged that decision in the High Court. Mm -hmm. Uh, they challenged one of the statements that the inspector made in their decision notice. Um, and the inspectorate have, um, well, surely you correct me the phrase and if I get it wrong, but they, they're basically the inspectorate have, have backed down fighting that JR. So in effect, that decision now reverts back to the inspectorate. Um, uh, and it looks as if we might have to go through that inquiry again um, mm. to, get the, uh, to, get, to get another outcome. Um, so I'll keep members informed, but just to let you know, although it got dismissed the first time, it's been reverted back to the inspectorate to, to make the decision again. Thank you. 
Thank you for that. And I note that several um, decisions are due to be issued today. So that will be interesting. Certainly a couple of those will be interesting, um, certainly to me. Um, right, then uh, agenda item 15, we leap forward. Application 210891, full application, minor for the Hook and Parrot in East Walk, Seaton, pages 107 to 151. Um, this has been before us before, you recall, and there was an issue over the overhang, um, as it would be overhanging the highway. So um, over to you, Mr Rose. Thank you, Chair. Let me just share my screen. There we go. Yeah, so this is the Hook and Parrot Inn in Seaton. Um, it's an application for demolition of the public house, uh, which had a, a sort of nightclub, if that's the right word, a, a lower level, and three apartments, and construction of a, a bar stroke restaurant and nine apartments above. Uh, it's before you as the support from the ward member, but as Councillor Rag said, this was deferred from the uh, August committee because there was um, there were issues over the ownership because the red line extends beyond the front of the building and uh, extends onto land uh, owned or it appears it's owned by East Devon. Uh, and certainly to address that, the applicant since the August committee has served notice on East Devon as the owner and also on Devon County. Uh, who have uh, some maintenance right over the land as well. So that issue in terms of um, ownership uh, has been addressed through the serving of the, of the correct uh, certificates. Um, so uh, members will recall, yeah, that this application was before you in August. Uh, so we've got, uh, at the moment, we've got a, a building that's got a, a, lower, a lower basement area, sort of a, 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 a well, what's a sort of nightclub or late opening pub, and then a at the lower ground and then we've got the the pub level and then it goes up to the residential units above and it's located on the on the seafront um, and we've got a proposal for a uh, members may recall so we've got parking at the at the lower basement level uh, as shown there with access off off harbour road to nine parking spaces uh, and then we go uh, where are we then we go up so we've got the the, the car park below we get the restaurant at uh, sort of uh, at the at the, the level of the front to so the promenade. Uh, so you come into the, the restaurant and then we get uh, three floors of these flats above. So you've got four stories in a basement, nine parking spaces, and you get nine two bedroom units. And this is the, the design that members will recall from committee uh, previously. Um, and the, the side elevation there uh, and the rear, uh, and then a cross section through the building. Um, and then the details here, which I'll talk about of the, the materials and change design height and width. Um, so it's located here on seat and seafront prominent site uh, just off the roundabout and the promenade uh, facing onto the seafront. So this is the view looking down. The building is just here where my cursor is. You can see uh, on the seafront and it relates to this block here. Previously, as you can see, former pub now in a, in, in a, in a poor appearance. Um, so again, you see the views there uh, and from the frontage. And then from the rear, this is the car park. So the site is located in here. Um, and then you, so this is where the access to the vehicles will be coming down the side of the shop. And then you get to the rear. So this is the, the, the rear untidy element here. Uh, so this would be demolished and the new, new building uh, erected. So it was, uh, this application was before committee in August, previously recommended for refusal on design and amenity grounds. So there were concerns about the uh, height of the building, the block, uh, sorry, the height of the building, its size uh, and its width, and also the materials that were proposed. It was very dark in color, very heavy. Um, and members deferred it uh, for officers to go away and address those issues of design and amenity. And I'm pleased to say the applicant has submitted amended plans and we've got and, and addressed those issues of uh, the design um, and the height uh, and uh, changed some balconies uh, and addressed the amenity issue. And as I said, addressed the ownership issue. In terms of the design, uh, they've reduced the height by approximately a metre and the width by just under a metre. 
and previously proposed, which caused officers concerns, but it was proposed in black brick. Now we've got light, uh, a light brick and a grey slate roof. And then the whole of the floor, the ground floor is glazed and you can see the glazing above. Um, so in the report, it goes through the principle of development. We're in the built up area boundary strategy 25 for Seton uh, encourages the enhancement of the town and encourages new homes in the town. And this complies with that. Uh, and in terms of policy E9, it talks about uh, aid in the vitality and viability of the town centre. And that will be maintained through this proposal by the, uh, the restaurant element being included within the scheme. That will keep an active use and obviously bring investment to the town, which is welcome and supported. Um, so there's strong support for the principal, given that this will regenerate the site and the investment that's going in there. And hence, you will note the support uh, from the town council uh, and, and in particular officers are welcoming of the, uh, the restaurant, the ground floor and the redevelopment and the benefits uh, and the economic benefits that will provide. With regard to the uh, visual impact, here we go. Um, it's in the conservation area, members recall, um, uh, the con and uh, we need to give special regard to its visual impact in the, in the conservation area. Um, there are some benefits from retaining the existing building, but members uh, were moving at last committee towards supporting a redevelopment of the site. Um, and obviously the amended design has been done to achieve, to ensure that it, it, it uh, in, uh, preserves the character and appearance of the conservation area. There will be a greater visual impact from the building due to its greater mass uh, and greater height, um, but obviously the existing building on the site is in a, in a poor condition. Um, and the building will be taller uh, than the uh, previous building on the site. But on balance, uh, whilst the conservation team would prefer to see a redevelopment of the existing building because of its, its historic nature, um, the amended design of the scheme is now positive and it's considered to um, be uh, in keeping with the area and will lift the seafront. So those regeneration benefits are considered to preserve the, the conservation area. The um, with the there are the other concern that was raised at committee previously was the uh, amenity impact from the scheme because of the height of the block and its relationship to the surrounding properties. Let me find the photos. Again, the applicant has addressed that through this scheme. Um, they've pulled the building in from the side. They've lowered the height. They've amended the balcony designs to prevent or reduce the uh, overlooking uh, onto the neighbours. And with regard to the elements at the rear, they've amended, uh, again, the width and the height. And whilst there are going to be some close relationships to windows here from the greater height, you can see that there's already a tight knit area at the back here. Um, so on balance, those amenity impacts are considered to be acceptable. There's no highway concerns. Um, but the main issue addressed in the report is the fact that the site is in flood zone three. Um, so the site is at risk of flooding from the sea and the overtopping of the of the sea wall. Uh, and this is particularly because there's a basement element included uh, within or the scheme has a basement. So obviously it goes below this road level here. So the whole of the site is at risk of flooding uh, and around and back, including the road at the rear. Uh, and of course, that's uh, that's got to be kept in mind and taken into account because of climate change. So the sea levels will rise and that flood risk will only get worse as time goes on. Um, the FRA argues that the site is in flood zone one, um, but that's not the case. The site is in flood zone three. And the original response from the Environment Agency raised no objection. Their original response when we went to committee in August uh, accepted that the site levels were raised such that they... Uh, we're happy that uh, it wouldn't be at risk of flooding. But uh, we've had further comments in, in response to the amended design um, and there are further comments from the Environment Agency where they say that the site is actually in flood zone three and they have concerns about the site within the flood zone uh, and concerns about the levels and mitigation put forward. Mm -hmm. And their comments also say that because it's in the flood zone, the scheme needs to pass the sequential test. And we've had further comments from the Environment Agency in the last few days on the scheme, which say they maintain their position outlined previously that development will only be acceptable where further work is undertaken to fully assess and manage the flood risks of the proposal, some of which can be secured through planning conditions. 
It's evident from the submitted information that the application lacks the full assessment of flood risk necessary to ensure that development can be made safe uh, through appropriate and sufficient mitigation over its lifetime. And then they go on to uh, reiterate that it's in flood zone three and it needs to pass the sequential test. So this, I'm a, unfortunately, is a change of position from the Environment Agency from the previous application. Um, and as I mentioned, they're saying that the uh, application, oh, what's that? Stop that. Um, the application um, requires uh, it to go through the sequential test, uh, which members will be aware requires us to be able to say that the development can't go elsewhere. Um, and really, the, the concern for the Environment Agency, to my mind, relates to the additional residential unit. So uh, there's no issue with having the uh, restaurant on the ground floor. That's not a vulnerable risk. It's the fact that we're going from three units to nine units. So it's those extra six units in the flood zone that are causing the Environment Agency uh, concern. Mm -hmm. The applicant's view is that the regeneration benefits from the scheme, which, which there are uh, and are outlined in the report, um, are such that they outweigh those concerns and that this redevelopment can't go elsewhere. And as such, the site passes the sequential test. But in terms of the sequential test, that, um, it, it's clear that those additional six units could be located elsewhere, uh, not within the flood zone. And uh, with regard to those six units, we don't have any viability information from the applicant to say that they couldn't convert the building or that the scheme is unviable with uh, a lesser number of units. Um, so in light of the additional uh, residential units and the objections from the EA, um, it, it's put officers in a, in a difficult position because we want to support the scheme in principle, but we don't like overruling the Environment Agency where they are raising flood risk concerns. And obviously in the climate change age or even before that, we shouldn't be supporting new uh, residential development in a flood zone. So it's for members to, uh, to, to balance up those economic benefits and the regeneration benefits of the site versus the, the flood risk harm. There are clear economic benefits as I've outlined, uh, but there will be harm from placing those additional units in the, uh, in the flood zone. And uh, in light of the lack of viability uh, information submitted to justify that those additional units are needed, uh, officers have, have come down on the side of, uh, on balance of recommending Refusal, because as I say, we don't like going against the Environment Agency and uh, supporting more residential units in the flood zone than, than, than we believe is needed. Uh, so, yeah, so it's an unbalanced recommendation of refusal, uh, mainly due to that late uh, objection from the Environment Agency. Um, but the application does provide those visual benefits and redevelopment. We welcome the investment in the site, welcome the restaurant. Um, but as I say, it is in the flood zone. So it's for members to balance up uh, that harm from being in the flood zone and the additional units against the benefits of the scheme. But as I say, on balance, officers are reluctant to go against the Environment Agency and send a message that dwellings in the flood zone are acceptable. So on balance, we're recommending refusal. Thank you. Thank you, Chris. Um, right. Uh... It's a difficult one, this one, because, you know, clearly it needs some. Um tidying up somewhat. Um, so anyway, I'd like to welcome to the meeting Robin Upton, the agent. Welcome to the meeting, Mr. Upton. Uh, you have three minutes to present your case. Thank you, Chair. Uh, my name is Robin Upton uh, from Tetch Tech Planning, speaking on behalf of the applicant. Uh, following deferment uh, in, in August, I'd like to thank officers for working with us to address the previous concerns and red line issues that are now resolved. The result of this diligent work is, I admit, a much better design that is reduced in scale and a palette of materials more in keeping with the area. Having been given this comprehensive and long list of matters to be addressed, I was somewhat surprised to read the current officer's report re recommending refusal on sequential test grounds. Had this issue been raised earlier, or the, at least the Environment Agency raised it earlier and not changed their minds, we would have had the opportunity to address this point, but we have <coughs> become aware of this issue last week when the officer's report was published. Members, what the sequential test requires us to demonstrate is that there's nowhere else where this development could theoretically be located. Yes, you've heard that right. It gets worse. Officers accept that the restaurant is in the right location, but consider that the flats above could be located elsewhere due to risk. The flats are of course well above theoretical flood level. The development clearly can't go elsewhere. 
The proposals involve the demolition of an existing building and a new building in its place. How can this development go elsewhere? I don't understand why the flats are of concern as A, there are already flats above the existing pub, and B, the Environment Agency has no concerns with the principle of the development. The Environment Agency has confirmed that the exceptions test is passed, which proves that the occupants of the flats would be safe from flooding. So what's the problem? Mr Rose has intimated that the Environment Agency still has technical concerns. However, this is not the case. That they have no objection to the principle of the development and recommend conditions to deal with matters of detail. Speaking to Mr Rose after the report was published, he has indicated that the sequential test could potentially be passed if we were to provide further additional information. If this is the case, why not not agree that the sequential test is passed? Members, there are two options available to approve this development here today. Option one, as Mr. Rosen mentioned, was to agree that the benefits of the development could not be delivered elsewhere. These benefits include the restaurant, jobs, expenditure in the local area, new homes, and the secondary benefit of facilitating the regeneration of this part of the seafront. This option agrees that there is nowhere else for the development to be located and thus the sequential test is passed. The Office of 30 seconds remaining. Thank you. Uh, the officer's report refers to uh, a development at Treba on the Seaton Beach uh, East Walk application that was considered to pass the sequential test for this reason. Even if the sequential test isn't passed, option two allows this committee to consider that the benefits of the development outweigh the harm, acknowledging that the occupants of the development would be safe. Chair and committee, we respectfully request that the application is approved using either of these two options. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Mr. Upton. Um, right now we go to the ward members. Uh, welcome to the meeting. Uh, first, Councillor Hartnell, please. You have five minutes. Okay, thank you, Chair. Um, I'd like to uh, emphasise the importance and significance of this location uh, for the proposed development. It's sited in prime position facing the sea and in close proximity to both town centre shops and facilities. The Hook and Parrot sits literally in the centre of the proposed seafront enhancement scheme. For those of you that are unaware, the scheme was conceived as a result of regener regeneration efforts by this council and had planning approval which elapsed last year. And there are now ongoing efforts to get it back on track. The approval of this development will act as a catalyst to kickstart the future regeneration of the seafront, demonstrating a confidence from private investors that will only be replicated by others. There is widespread public support. There's wide, um, the town council also have no objections. And there's also support from all three ward councillors and county councillor. The applicant has listened and through the amended plans have addressed the concerns of neighbours by removing the potential overlooking from balconies, addressing design issues and reducing the overall massing and height of the building. There are clear economic benefits from this development. The net increase of six residential units on a brownfield site is welcome and once occupied will further support the town's shops and businesses. The restaurant will employ 30 part-time and full-time staff and become established as a destination in its own right with further indirect benefits to the local economy. In conclusion, the significant benefits to Seaton from this proposed scheme can only be delivered in this location and as such considerably outweigh any harm with regards to flood risk. A brownfield site of this kind simply cannot be replicated along the immediate coastline with lower risk of flooding and in any case would not deliver the much needed improvement to the seafront commercial area, which in relation to the entire seafront of Seaton is relatively small. The applicants have demonstrated through their flood risk assessment that suitable measures can be employed to ensure safe access and egress in case of a flooding event. Local knowledge also dictates that the road directly in front of the site actually serves as a holding area for flooding from waves that overtop the wall, and recent events confirm that. I'm at odds with the change of position of the Environment Agency and believe the in principle no objection stance should be upheld. I would ask the committee to give significant weight to the economic and regenera regeneration benefits as described and that the additional six units ensure the viability of the whole scheme. Should committee have concerns regarding flood risk, risk I would request that conditions were served on the applicant rather than refusal. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Councillor Hartnell. Um, Councillor Ledger, you have five minutes. I don't think Councillor Ledger's in the meeting, Chair. Is he not? No. Oh. 
he was down to speak. I think you have a statement from um, Councillor Rowland, Wendy. Yes, I do. Yeah. So, uh, like Councillor. Yeah, certainly, Chair. So, Councillor Rowland um, would like me to say thank you for giving me the opportunity to have my comment read out to members of the planning committee as my plan had been to attend this meeting but has been overtaken by other events. The site in question is in desperate need of redevelopment as the current building is in a very poor state, mm. unoccupied as in, and is in a prime site on Seaton Seafront where other developments in the vicinity are proposed as part of the long overdue regeneration of the area. The developers have fully taken on board the comments from both the planning committee of Seaton Town Council and this committee last August. The Environment Agency did not raise any objections to the original, original application, but are now saying that the revised development should be delivered on, a, on an alternative and reasonable available site of the lower flood risk. Based on my knowledge of the area, I find this is a staggering statement to make, bearing in mind the nature of the proposed business for the redevelopment and the fact that the existing building was a public house with attached accommodation. In addition, this part of the seafront is already protected by a seawall and floodgates and the most recent road flooding event in the vicinity was caused by heavy rainfall and the inadequate inadequacy sorry I can't say that word of the <laughs> drain system due to lack of maintenance that could be rectified by the relevant authority I would therefore ask the committee members to look favourably on the revised plans for the reasons I have given, where the developer has taken on board all the revisions requested before the new comment from the Environment Agency that was not forthcoming in the first application. End of statement. Thank you, Wendy. And I'm sure, you know, members will be concerned that this was a late submission from the environment agency apparently and that the developer had um, Chair, tried to... um so, sorry Chair. to interrupt um, yes Dan's just councillor ledger's just arrived in the meeting okay okay um councillor ledger you have five minutes welcome to the meeting thanks very much chair and uh apologies for for not being here i, I thought it was going to be part of the afternoon session <coughs> um running a little bit blind here with not knowing what's been said previously. Um, I think I just need to, to reiterate the, the points made previously that this is very much welcome development. It's very much needed. Um, the, the current premises is in a state of disrepair and I think it is the opinion that it will most likely have to be demolished at some point to be brought back into a state of um, well, or it would cost a significant amounts of money, which I don't think any developer will bring forward. Um, I appreciate that the, the applicants now have reduced the height of the building. They've made it more in keeping and they, they have addressed a lot of the uh, objections previously held. Um, I think just speaking from a personal point of view, um, it is something that the town very much needs, not just for the economic development, but for tidying up the seafront. Uh, everyone that I've spoken to has, has been in favour of this development. It's very, very few objections, especially with this renewed, um, this renewed application. Uh, and that's all I'd like to say today. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Ledger. Um, as I was saying before you, know, you came in, uh, it does seem that the developer has complied with all the requirements that um, have been made. And it's unfortunate that the Environment Agency came in with this uh, submission uh, late, late in the process. So, um, I mean, I, I'm at a loss to... Um, sure, I think just, what could go there, really. Chair, just, just on that point, that with the objection, could that not be sorted through uh, conditions made by this planning committee? 
Um, I don't think that there is another site that you can place a um, place a pub within yeah. the town centre to to hold that. And sorry for my interjection, but I, I do feel that that's something that the planning committee can um, go forward with with conditions. Chair, who's speaking? Who's speaking? Who is that? That's Councillor Ledger. Uh, um, I think we'll go back to Mr Rose on that one. I think that's a valid point, Mr Rose. Thank you, Chair. Yeah, so the, the, the issue, as I tried to explain, is the six extra units. So you definitely welcome the restaurant and there's already three units on site. So if that were part of the scheme, that would be no worse. The issue for the Environment Agency is that we are putting six more units in the flood zone and putting them those residents at risk. They may be raised out of the ground, but you get this issue that when the site's surrounded by flooding, you then get pressure on the emergency services. So that's the issue. And it's, yeah. it's clear from a sequential test point of view that those six units could go elsewhere in the town or the district. Uh, what I've said to the applicant is uh, I don't think that that sequential test for those six extra units isn't going to be passed because it's clear that they could go elsewhere. Um, it would have been preferable to have some viability information to show that the scheme is unviable if those six additional units aren't included, but we don't have that. Um, so I think the issue then is for you as members, as you've heard from the ward members, to decide there is a flood risk ejection. It doesn't pass a sequential test, but do you feel there are other benefits that outweigh that? Thank you. Mr. And then, sorry, and, sorry, and if you do feel there's other benefits, then yes, the issues of flood risk in terms of uh, mitigating it should it flood can certainly be dealt with by condition. Thank you, Mr. Rose. That's helpful. Now, um, I'm going to ask um, members to put your hands down because I'd like uh, Mr. Upton, if he's prepared, to answer any questions that members might have. Can, so can you put your hands down and only raise your hand if you have a question from Mr Upton, please? I'm trying to be very fair here. Um, right, Councillor Skinner. Sorry, I, I'm, I'm trying to raise, lower my hand because I want to speak, obviously. All so, right, yeah. So I'm, I, haven't, I don't have a question for Councillor. So okay. I don't know. I Mr don't have Upton, a question. are you prepared to take questions? I should have asked. Yeah, I, I certainly am. I, I can. Yeah. I can ask a question of myself um, and answer that if... <laughs> well, you go ahead then, do that. Well, the question I would like to ask myself is <laughs> who, whose responsibility is it to determine if the sequential test is passed? Is it the environment agencies or is it the district councils? And the answer to that is that it's the district council's um, responsibility mm -hmm. to determine the sequential test is passed, not the environment agency. The environment agency's job is to ensure that the occupants would be, um, you know, safe uh, from flood risk. And yes. as Rose has pointed out, those matters can be dealt with by condition. So if the council were to determine that the sequential test is passed, that wouldn't be going against the environment agency's recommendation or objections, as, as they've, sta they've stated that they are in support of the principle of the development. So this isn't a case of having to go against uh, an environment agency concern. It's purely within the gift of the district council to decide whether or not the sequential test is passed. And I just think that's quite an important point. Thank you. Yes, I, I would agree with that. Um, right, Sarah Jackson, Councillor Jackson, do you have a question? No, apologies. Sorry, it was just to let you know that Dan was um, trying to log into the meeting. OK. Councillor Woodward, you have a question? Thank you. Yes, thank you, Chair. Uh, from Mr Upton, the, there's a reference in the report to um, if there was flooding and cars are damaging the support system for the building. I was wondering if you could comment. And then there was also a comment from the urban designer saying he's <laughs> surprised whether the building would stand up for very long. Um, whether you could comment upon the, the safety or the, of the structure of the building in the event that there was flooding and there were <clears throat> knocking about downstairs. Sure, yeah. Well, firstly, I would say that the, the proposed car park is, is a much less vulnerable use than the nightclub, which is in the current location. Obviously, you know, to, 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 uh, theoretically flood um, full of party goers, then that's a lot worse than cars. But th the answer to the structural element is that that can be dealt with by a condition. I mean, anything can be made to withstand 
um, you know, the sorts of impacts of cars moving around in flood water. But the, the point that we're trying to make is that actually the, the whole site is, the levels are above the theoretical flood risk. And, um, and I think as one of the wall members pointed out that the overtopping of waves uh, wouldn't see that basement or car park area flooded. But what the Environment Agency have asked us to do is, is ensure that effectively we prove via engineering reasons, technical details, um, to show that the, the effectively the, 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 the construction of the building can um, deal with those sorts of impacts if they were to occur. And, you know, everything is possible from an engineering point of view. And there's lots of car parks, underground car parks that are uh, in flood zones with, with flats above. Um, so it's not an uncommon scenario uh, to, to try and deal with. Um, and the point about the urban designer, uh, we have had a, a structural engineer um, look at the proposals. He's provided a report them, you know, detailing exactly the method of construction. Um, and I, I believe the urban designer uh, is now uh, uh, happy with the, the actual construction uh, approach um, you know, has been designed properly. It's gone through all the structural calculations to make sure that the, the balconies, etc., you know, are all are all dealt with properly and the, the structure is is sound. Um, so I believe all of those matters have been addressed. Okay, fine. Thank you very much. Thank you, Councillor Lawrence. You have a question. Thank you, Chair. Uh, Mr. Upton, I'd just like to know from you. First of all, I've got to say that I, I do applaud the work that's been done to make it look better. And something does need to be done to this building to, to get it sorted out. Um, it was mentioned earlier about a, a financial viability report that if you didn't have nine um, residential units above the, the, the base, um, would it be would it still be financially viable to carry on with the regeneration of this particular project? Yeah. Um, we did provide some um, high level um, values of effectively how much it would cost to demolish and um, uh, demolish the existing building. Obviously, that's a cost. And then the construction cost of uh, um, the restaurant and one floor of um, flats and the value that you would get from that return is is probably a million pounds short of what would be needed um, to, to build it. Um, and I, I have put all of those costs in a, in a letter uh, that was submitted with the amended plans. Admittedly, they're high level, but at that stage, we weren't asked to provide uh, detailed uh, viability. But I, ha I, have, I have given the information uh, to demonstrate that, that those upper floors are, are needed Effectively, it's enabling development to enable the restaurant to come forward and for the whole development to come forward. Um, so, but it, it's also common sense, really. You know, it, it's, it's a lot of money to build that building. Uh, it's about three million to, to build that building. And the, I think the, the restaurant's valued at about a quarter of a million. Um, so you, you can see that something is required to, to, to effectively fund that benefit. Thank you for that. I, I do agree that something needs to be done with it. Um, and as I said before, I do applaud the work that's been done so far. I think you have to understand that Mr. Rose and the, and the officers are um, between a rock and a hard place here because mm -hmm. the Environment Agency is saying it, it's a flood risk. And if we allow um, building of um, houses and, and so on in flood, flood zone three, all over the, the, the county, um, they could come, they could get themselves involved in all sorts of trouble, and they're setting a bit of a precedent here to allow this to happen. Um, and at the end of the day, they are residential units, but something has to give. Um, and I'm coming down more in favour of, of allowing the development subject to to the conditions that have already been said. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Lawrence. Councillor Gazard, you have a question. Yes, please. Um, <clears throat> Mr. Upton, it might seem um, a, a silly question, but I can't see anywhere in the report, and forgive me if I have missed it, um, with, with the restaurant, um, what um, precautions have you put in for if there's a fire? Because uh, my, my question is, should the fire go upwards, uh, what safety precautions have you put in for, um, for coping with a fire in the building? 
I mean, the, the, the short answer to that is that it would all be dealt with un, under building regulations. Mm -hmm. You know, that deals with fire separation, fire sprinklers if they're required, um, uh, and, you know, ensuring that the materials between the restaurant and the floors above are, are fire resistant um, and, you know, and that there's adequate uh, means of escape. Um, you know, it's, it's effectively, it's a, it's a building regulations issue that we would have to comply with the relevant fire safety requirements, um, whatever the building regulations dictate. Thank you. Uh, right, I see no more hands up to ask questions, so we go into committee now. Um, Councillor Skinner. Thank you, Chair. Um, I've lost my train of thought now with all of that. I had it all on pat when I was there. Um, Shall I go to Councillor No, 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 no. I absolutely know where I'm going to come from. Um, I find this, this, this particular... Um, um, development. Um, we had this come to us in uh, August time. We didn't like the design. That was proud. Pr pr forget the environment agency stuff for the minute. Let's deal with where we were and the path of travel that we took. And the path of travel was we didn't like the design. We asked for them to go back and bring forward a design that was more in keeping. I believe that design is much more in keeping. It is something I very much support. And that's the path of travel that what that we had and that would have been relayed back to the um, applicant and through with them and the officers um, have certainly come across um, bringing back something much more uh, in keeping I believe and, and certainly taking away the black bricks was, was the black bricks were horrendous um, and that's why we we put went for a deferral to get ourselves into a better place and I think we've got ourselves into a much better place it is rather Unfortunate at the 11th hour that the Environment Agency have come in with this, but we've, we've got an application here whereby there were very, quite a, quite a big thing happening on a seafront. Very few objections, lots of support, three ward members all banging the drum about how this is going to be good for their town. That's where they represent their town. And this has got positive support all the way from, I mean, I'm going to be going against the officer's recommendation and recommendation for approval, but just, uh, so I, I set that down now. But the one thing we need to be guarded against, I'm sure other members will feel exactly the same, as the, as, as the Environment Agency has come at the length now, and you're quite right, Chair, through you, uh, you did mention the dilemma of which way we're in, and it seems a little bit unfortunate for the applicants that the Environment Agency have come in at the 11th hour to chuck a, a grenade in, in, into the plans. And I think it's difficult for our officers as well. And I think if the officers hadn't had that, there would be no doubt there'd be a recommendation here for an approval. Now, I think what we need to do to be able to guard against where we are and bearing in mind, and I, I get what Mr. Rose said, because I was going to say, well, if it flooded, it's in the car parking, then it's in the restaurants and that's not the upstairs. But there's always the issue around if people had to um, come out of uh, uh, units and come down, I get all that. But I, I think that there should be we should be moving towards and, and I would be I would garner my my thoughts towards uh, Mr. Rose to come up with what would be suitable for a condition that would guard us against the Environment Agency's um, um, reservations, um, uh, reluctance to to support this, that how we can get through that and how we get through the sequential test. And I'm sure lots of these things can be done, but I'm going to be moving for a recommendation of approval, subject to the condition, I would please ask Mr. Rose if he would do the wording for me of what he would absolutely know what that would probably need to be. And I'm sure other members are going to come in behind this because this is really, really important for Seton. And if I've got any interest to declare, when I first became a portfolio holder, I was, I was the regeneration chairman really at the tail end of Seton. And I'd never spent a lot of time in Seton. And then I spent a good 12 months or so and Seton has got a real opportunity to raise the bar and up its level. And this type of investment and encouraging developers to come with this type of investment, three million pound plus likely to be put into the scheme to raise the bar for Seton and make it into a much better place, I think is only commendable. And in, in the times that we're going and going forward, I think it's particularly commendable at this moment in time and where we're going forward with business. So me, I'm very supportive of, of this scheme. We asked them to for an amendment. They asked for better plans, better come up with better structures, 
better, better design. They've done all of those things, ticked all of those boxes, and we just need to get over this other issue. And it sounded to me like what Mr. Rhodes was saying was, yes, and we can do that through a condition. So other than the wording of that condition, which I'm sure Mr. Rose will put together, that's what I'm going to be supporting, a recommendation of approval with the condition that goes with it to get over the flooding issues. Thank you. Happy to second it. The Skinner seconder, please. <laughs> Councillor De Serum, happy to, happy to second, Chair. Thank you. Would you like to speak on that? Very briefly, yes. I would say that I totally endorse what Councillor Skinner said, and I also endorse what the applicant said, that this project will enable the restaurant and the whole development to come forward, as the ward councillor said. I also note with caution the mess that, uh, as Mr Rose said, the message shouldn't be given that uh, putting dwellings into flood zones are acceptable. But I think that clearly here we, we have a situation where the economic benefits of the benefits clearly outweigh uh, the, the issues of the flood zones. Uh, and, and so I think that we should let it go for this reasons. And I've also um, been able to do a little research in the meantime, and I believe there was a very similar application it, it, very close by under reference 16 stroke 2795 full. Um, I believe that was a very similar thing which took place in, in, in Seaton uh, a short time ago. So I believe it is possible and, and that is why I'm, I'm happy to support it, simply to assist with the regeneration of uh, the much needed regeneration of the town. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Councillor Desarum. Now I'm going to ask um, Mr. Rose if he'd like to come back before members actually, you know, um, decide in their minds and 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 vote on it. Um, Mr. Rose, could you say what that condition would be? Any conditions, please? Thank you, Chair. Yeah, so there might, there might be more than more than one condition yeah. needed, but but really it's going to be uh, so. I think where members are at is is we have to say that the sequential test isn't passed, but but what members are saying is that the regeneration, uh, the the economic, the regeneration, and the visual benefits of the scheme outweigh the fact that the site is in the flood zone. Uh, but that that's not a message to other developers that you know we 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 allow development in the flood zone. It's a rare exception. Uh, and uh, once you've accepted those schemes, uh, these dwellings in the flood zone, we then move on to putting the conditions on to protect the building, the structure and those residents as much as possible should that flood risk occur. Thank you, Mr. Rose. Um, one question I have, um, um, perhaps the developer, the agent can answer this. Would those flats be for rent or would they be for sale? Um, potentially both. Okay, thank you. So if somebody was um, felt that they were at risk, they wouldn't um, choose to buy and live in one of those flats, presumably. Can I, can I also suggest that one of the environment agency recommendations is that um, effectively the residents would be on a, 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 a a calling system, a, a risk, you know, a broadcast uh, system. So if, yes. if there was going to be predicted flood problems, that they would receive a telephone call. Yes. Um, you know, warning them that this might happen. It's a, yeah. It's a fairly standard thing, and, and one of the environment agency requests is that if you know if the development is approved, that 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 is um, that, that 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 measure, and also that the structural measures are all all dealt with. Um, yeah, I'm more than happy to provide that information. Thank you. Yeah, uh, having been on the Southwest Regional Flood and Coastal Committee for about twelve years, I'm I'm well aware of um, the measures that are in place. So it's a valid point, um, Councillor Howe. Thank you very much. And as much as I want to support this at this time, and I certainly don't want to refuse it, so I won't recommend refusal. I still have doubts. And those doubts are due to the 24th of June last year when a tower block in Miami collapsed because of water ingress. Mm. Um, and the Environment Agency is quite clear in its two paragraphs. With future sea level rise over the next 100 years, plus 1.4 metres on current level, the site could very probably be at risk from a similar event and is therefore important not to rely solely on existing models. Mm. There are also photos of the floodwaters. This is overtopping floodwaters in uh, January this uh, last year. Uh, the fact that the FRA does not consider this means it cannot conclude that development is safe over its lifetime. 
So my first thought is, right, let's have a deferral again, much to my annoyance. We're doing away with the sequential test. I've got no problem with, with the reasons for, to do away with the sequential test and everything else. But the FRA definitely needs looking at to make sure that is clarified. The second paragraph then goes on. Further, our comments relating to flood resistance, resilience and resistance, undercroft parking and safe egress and access um, outlined in our previous response dated the 2nd of November are still relevant. We suggest that you as authority consult with building control on the matters of, and I know structure is building control, it's not us, um, but the proposal of the, in, a, in the context of a flood event and cars damaging the structure. This is quite reminiscent of that Miami tower block collapse and we need to be really careful about what we're doing when we allow a building to be built without the correct structure. So all I want is a short deferral, short deferral, to get the FRA and ideally building control just to clarify the building will be structurally sound. We know it is, and we know it's outside our planning authority, but I can't at this time vote to put people at risk. And it is not risk of being stuck in their flat particularly, I am worried about 10, 20, 30 years down the ro road when this building could well collapse because of water ingress on those pillars and everything else. So I would like very much a deferral um, to get those two matters sorted out so we can have confidence that this building can be built to the, to the correct higher standards than the current standards that are being allowed. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. So that's an amendment. Is there a seconder for that amendment, please? Councillor Gazard. Councillor Gazard. Um, yeah. I'll take the other speakers then. Um, Councillor Key. Thank, thank you, Chair. Yes, I mean, I mean, I've known this property for over 60 years. And um, I mean, the thing is, I mean, it's gradually sort of deteriorated over a period of time. And this is it. I mean, this everybody sort of got this uh, flood problem. I mean, wherever you live, I mean, apart from where I live, I mean, I live 800 feet up, so I'm OK. But I mean, there are flood. We've had this problem down at Exmouth, I think it was, where we actually had a development there and there was a problem where it was flooded and they wanted accommodation above. That was passed. I cannot see a problem with this whatsoever. Um, one of the things I would like to pick up with Councillor Howe, yes, I agree that the flats did collapse, but it was on up um, made up land. Now perhaps, um, you know, this is not made up land. This is actual land that is existing and has existed for years and years. Um, I mean, I fully support this application and I, I cannot see a problem with it because the structure will be built to actually withstand any flooding that is likely to appear over the next 30, 40, 50 years, perhaps. Um, and I mean, who is to say that the, uh, I mean, they forecast the raising of this uh, sea level, but I've spoken to somebody in actual fact who is very knowledgeable on this, and they said that some of these figures are blown out of all proportion, but I fully support this. The application was uh, deferred because of the overhanging of that. That has been rectified. The design has been rectified. I can't see any problem with this whatsoever, and I give it my full support. Thank you. Thank you. And I think the um, the cause of the collapse of the building that's already been mentioned in, in the United States was that there was an underground swimming pool there. Now, I think not there was a... determined, Chair. Sorry? Cause has still not been determined. Ah, well, it was said that it um, it was a, a swimming pool that was there. So, um, right, uh, Councillor Pratt. Yes, thank you, Chair. Um, it, well, it's quite clear that uh, the seafront at uh, Seaton is badly in need of uh, regeneration. And uh, um, I'm very uh, pleased to uh, see the redesign of the building from the uh, original uh, plans that we saw back in August and uh, I, um, I fully support this application 
but uh, um, the, uh, the, there are issues, obviously, in regard to the report from the Environment Agency. And I think what we do need to be sure is that there are conditions attached to a planning, applica- planning permission that will cover the issues regarding the building control of this building. So uh, I am in support of the application, uh, but uh, it's the conditions relating to uh, the building which are important here. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Woodward. Thank you, uh, Chair. There seems to be um, no doubt about the strong economic benefits which you've all mentioned. So that's uh, a given, I think, in this case. And our concern seems to be for risk uh, to life and to the um, occupiers. Um, I had noticed that uh, the uh, our own emergency planner was consulted and he is happy to accept the stay put uh, refuge strategy. So that's um, one area which might give us some comfort that um, the occupiers could stay. But I fully um, I do accept um, Councillor Howe's point of view. And that's very important point. But I do think we could cover that by condition. Well, hopefully we could cover it by condition rather than a refusal at this time and a deferment. So, so hopefully uh, maybe Mr. Rose could help us with a condition with regard to uh, building control and structure. And right. And then you might like to consider, depends on what Mr. Rose um, explains, you might like to consider that that will be acceptable and perhaps to withdraw the amendment, but that's for you to decide. Um, Mr. Rose, could you give any reassurance as to the structural safety of the building, please? Thank you. Yeah, so as as the agent said, I mean, really, that will be for the liaison with uh, building control. I, I suppose what I would say is if members are moving towards approval and accepting the units in the flood zone then i think then we move on to how we can ensure that the building is provided and constructed with the adequate mitigation uh, i think councillor howe is right that the environment agency have in effect said that they're they're not happy with the flood risk submitted by the applicant because the applicant has started from a position of saying it's in the, it's not in the flood zone So I think potentially we would have conditions asking for an updated uh, flood risk assessment, which in itself could then propose mitigation such as the alert system for the residents. uh, And then structurally in terms of plug socket levels, how it's constructed, and then a further condition on the structural integrity of the building that we can deal with in association with building control. So I think there's probably two or three conditions there uh, that, that, that we would put on to ensure or as much as we can that structurally the building sound in the flood uh, in a flood event and that the residents are protected uh, as much as possible. But uh, I think if you as members are accepting the, these units in the flood zone, then I think uh, we probably can then adequately deal with that uh, through a number of conditions. Right. Back to you, Councillor Howe, as proposer of the amendment. Would you be happy with that or would you still want a deferral? Um, it's people's lives at risk, isn't it? And, and versus the yeah. economy. And I, I've got real issue on it, but I want to see this happen. Um, with Mr. Rose's trouble is without seeing the conditions beforehand, Yes, I fully accept what Mr. Rose will do and how he'll do it, but I would rather see the conditions laid out and, and written down before we agree it. Um, because as Mr. Rose says, that's a number of conditions we're now going to stick on this on flood risk. Right. Could we, could we adjourn this until February meeting? I know the agenda's probably already pre-published, just so we can see those conditions and to get the applicant a decision as fast as we can, but we really ought to see those conditions. Okay. Well, you know, I suppose to you, Chair, with I don't know who. The war members are in support. I get that. We're we're supporting it, but we need we just need some really carefully worded conditions and we need some oversight over those conditions. Yeah. Yeah. Chair, Chair, if I may interject, the normal procedure for um a situation like this is that the conditions be they specific ones that members wish to apply or other conditions that the officers may consider relevant, such as period for implementation of the planning commission, the normal 
kinds of conditions are um, delegated to the chair and ward members in consultation. So um, whether that would suffice for Councillor Howe, that there would be ward member and uh, the chair of the committee's oversight over the wording of those conditions. Uh, I mean, uh, fundamentally, I can't think of another way around it. So I, I would have to, I, I suppose my, not reticence of letting the ward members um, deal with the conditions. I've got no problem with that, but they are actively supportive of this. Oh, not looking at the conditions and the, you know, the, the health and well-being of the residents as much, shall we say. Um, yeah. and, and it's a different scenario, but yeah. I'm happy for the chair and vice chair to be part of that equation. Yeah, I'll withdraw my, um, my amendment if that's OK with everybody. You would, because I'm quite prepared to bring this back to committee. Um, it is very important when, when we're talking about maybe risk to lives. Um, it, it's entirely up to you, Councillor Howe. Well, I mean, if I've got your, your support, Chair, I, I'm happy if we can do that. Mr Rose, could we do that? Could you get those conditions done up so we can get it on a, as a late item for February's meeting so the, uh, the applicant isn't delayed any further, shall we say? Uh, through you, Chair, yeah, we could probably put it on as a as a as a late item for the for the February committee. Uh, I wonder whether um, whether an alternative would be if uh, Councillor Howell might be more comfortable if once we've drafted those conditions, we've run them past the Environment Agency as as a sort of uh, you know advising them that we are accepting the building there and then run the conditions past them to to ensure that they're happy that the the best. The, you know the best is done in those circumstances yeah i'm, I'm as an alternative that. yeah that's perfect I'm, I'm more than happy with that suggestion okay thank you then uh we we'll take a vote on the amendment um wendy could you take the vote please no. or mrs Shaw. sorry I'm sorry, I'm sorry. I, I understood that um, Councillor Howe was happy to withdraw his deferral with yes. the delegation of the conditions to the chair, ward members and review of Environment Agency. Is, yeah. If Councillor yeah. Howe could confirm if that is what he intended. Provided, obviously, the uh, proposer and seconder are happy with that. Yes, absolutely. Um, from So from my perspective, I think... I I will go with that. I think drawing in Miami and comparing it to an application in East Devon is just ridiculous, in my opinion. Mm -hmm. But I, I, I feel I've lost yeah, 10 minutes of my life, really. But um, <laughs> if, if you feel that um, if they feel yeah. that that's what they want to do, we want to get into the right place. We can condition it with, uh, I feel, through the building regs anyway. I just think you're making a molehill out of a mountain here. Right? nonsense I, I don't if, if that is the case if there is such a scare zone going on here we better get all the buildings done up and down they're all going to be falling apart in a minute it's, you're just making it more into what it is but listen if it's going to get us over the line to get this through and to um, get the environment agency with their part uh through to the next meeting albeit i'm i'm personally i just feel want to get on and make this decision we put the conditions in and let's crack on with it and uh, make the decision that's where i'm at with it but um if I say members feel they want to go with this environment agency thing, asking them, I thought we were the planning committee, but uh, if you want to go and ask them, then so be it. If it gets over it, then so be it, I guess, under duress. Yeah, there's always the risk that they might not be happy with it and, and it will come back to committee again. So, But um, we are the planning authority, Chair. Absolutely. We're the planning I authority. Agree I agree with you. Um, right, back to you then, Mrs Shaw, to sum up. Does Councillor de Sarum as seconder agree that that amendment to the... Uh... I, I share Councillor Skinner's reluctance, but I also appreciate Councillor Howe's issues in Miami. So as long as this will get us over the line, I'm more than happy to, to carry on as, as suggested. Thank you very much, Chair. Yes. Shirley, sorry, can I just step in? Just, just to confirm okay. that my, my intention would be to, to run the conditions past the Environment Agency to check that we've covered everything. But, you know, if they continue to raise their objection, then, you know, uh, the me member's decision will overrule that. What we're trying to do is just make sure that uh, in terms of conditions, we've got what we need. 
Uh, and well so said. I wouldn't I wouldn't intend that, you know, if the environment and the agency still raise concerns about the principle, we bring it back to committee. It's just running it past them to ensure that we've covered the mitigation that we need to. Well said. Yes. Thank you. Right. Um, back to you, Shirley. Thank you very much, Chair. Yes, members. Um, we have the recommendation to uh, approve with the conditions delegated to officers in consultation with the chair and vice chair with a review of the environment agency in relation to the conditions to address flood risk concerns. If when your name is called, would you please indicate whether you support the motion to recommend approval, whether you're against the motion to recommend approval, or whether you're abstaining from the vote. Thank you. Okay, so I'll start with Councillor Bloxham. Support approval. Councillor Brown. <coughs> Councillor Brown, sorry. are you there? Yeah, I am, yes, yeah, sorry, I forgot to turn the mic on. Yeah, um, 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 approval, please. Thank you. Councillor Chamberlain. Support approval with conditions. Councillor Coleman. Approved with conditions. Councillor Davy. Support approval. Councillor De Serum. Support motion to recommend approval with conditions. Councillor Gazard. Support with the conditions that have been made. Thank you. Councillor Howe. Support. Councillor Key. Approve. Councillor Lawrence. Support approval. Councillor Pratt. Support approval with conditions. Councillor Skinner. Support. Councillor Woodward. Support approval. Councillor Rag. Support the proposal to approve. Thank you. So that's recommended for approval. Thank you. Thank you, Wendy. Um, right, then we move on to agenda item 17, that application 21. 2123 Change of Use NHS Vaccination Centre, Greendale Business Park, Woodbury Salterton, pages 162 to 170. Um, I'd like to welcome Malcolm Gig and the ward members, Councillors Ingham and Young, to the meeting. Welcome to the meeting. And over to you, Mr. Rose, to present your report. Thank you, Chair. Yeah, so this is the uh, the NHS vaccination centre at Greendale Business Park. It's before you because the application is a departure from the local plan. And it's an application for continued use of the vaccination centre until the end of this year. So you can see the, uh, the business park here and the site is at the edge uh, of the business park with an access in off the A3052, although... Since the report was published, a, a further access has been put into the to the north of the, the site under permitted development rights. Um, um, so some of you might have been there and, and been vaccinated. Vaccinated. We've got uh, level higher levels around here. We've got the building, and then we've got parking area, and then into the vaccination centre. Um, and it's it's just a large uh, open warehouse building, in effect, uh, run by the by the NHS for the vaccination. You can see here the area of the site and the extent of the, the consented development uh, at Greendale. And this is the application site in here. So outside of the, the boundary for the business park. And these are the, the photos of it when it was in operation back in the summer. Um, so it's outside the built up area boundary or, or, or the boundary for the, for the business park uh, as defined by the village's DPD. Uh, and there's no support for development on this site in principle. In fact, policy E7 of the local plan makes it quite clear that there, there's no circumstances in which uh, Greendale uh, as a wider area should be extended uh, to allow these uses. But the use that you see in front of you was constructed by the NHS under emergency permitted development rights that the government bought in. Uh, basically, to address the pandemic, it gave local authorities and the NHS quite sweeping uh, permitted development rights basically to build buildings put structures in place to address the pandemic and this building was uh, constructed under those PD rights for the obvious reasons of allowing us to to go and get uh, vaccinated 
And those PD rights originally came in and allowed these uses to be uh, carried out and the buildings erected until the end of December 21, and that the buildings then had to be removed by December 22. Um, so at the time the applicant made these, this application, that legislation was clear that the use should have commenced uh, on the 1st of January this year with the building having to be removed by the 31st of December this year. So the applicant put in this application to retain the building uh, for an extra year to allow us to continue on with the uh, booster jabs and to give the NHS some flexibility because we're unsure what's going to happen with the pandemic you know, over the next few months and the remainder of the year. And there's a question mark about whether we might need fourth jabs. Uh, and if there are fourth jabs, it's looking likely, I understand from the NHS, that they're more likely to be carried out at these centres, these hubs to take the pressure off um, the doctor's surgery. However, uh, just before, literally uh, a few hours before we published this report on the agenda, the government announced that they had extended those permitted development rights. So, in, so this proposal now is actually uh, permitted development now until the end of this year. So until the 31st of December this year, uh, with the building having to be removed by the 31st of December the following year. Uh, and the application hasn't been withdrawn, so it's still with you uh, to, for consideration. Although in effect, uh, even if you were to refuse the application, they have permitted development rights for this. So uh, it's going to be there, but whatever your decision being quite, quite frank about it. Um, but you'll see in the report, even before the government ex uh, published uh, that legislation extending the permitted development rights, uh, we were supportive of the application on the benefit of the wide, on the basis of the wider public benefits here. As I said, this potential need for fourth jabs, the less reliance on the NHS and the doctor's surgery, and it gives that NHS that flexibility for the remainder of the year so that they can get a better grasp on the pandemic and what's happening. And you'll see in the report, there are no wider visual amenity or highway safety concerns raised. So we're recommending approval of this application uh, until so it can remain on site until the end of this year due to those public benefits. But as I say, just before publication of the report, uh, the retention of the building and the use on this site became permitted development anyway until the end of the year, but uh, recommended for approval in any case. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Rose. Um, just a correction. The pages were page 159 to 166. Um, right, welcome to the meeting. Mr. Gig, um, who's the agent, would you like to speak on this? You've got three minutes. Yes, thank you. It, it won't be a long speech. No. Um, Chairman, thanks for giving me the opportunity to talk before you today. Um, as you're aware, and as Mr. Rose has already said, uh, the application before you um, is for the further and current use of the vaccination centre at Greendale. Um, it's been stated that um, this is permitted development rights uh, put in place for the NHS. Um, the application before you, as Chris has already said, was submitted before the permitted development rights were increased. Um, and therefore the application was put in to safeguard the use for the NHS. Um, also due to the investment our clients have put into the buildings on behalf of the NHS, we wanted to make sure we had an approval in place. But as Chris has explained, um, very recently, the government has extended the permitted development rights for this site. Um, and therefore I don't think I really need to say any more, um, but thank you for the opportunity. Thank you. I'll call on the ward members, uh, Councillor Ingham. Is he here? I am chair. Uh, good morning. Hi. Good morning. And thanks for this. Thanks for this opportunity of speaking to your committee. Um, you, you will remember Councillor Ray Bloxham as a member um, of, of our district council. I worked very hard with him years ago when we, uh, with our last uh, local plan to define the restrictions, you know, with the help of officers for uh, this industrial park. And until very recently, Chair, I'd have said, there are no circumstances, you know, um, where we would consider any change. And then, uh, you know, a pandemic comes along and you realise that you really don't know what tomorrow brings and you have to accommodate situations. I, I, I hear what Mr. Rose has said and that uh, uh, there's, you know, uh, permitted development and so on is extended uh, and uh, uh, the, the, the building can stay until the end of next year, I think it was he said. 
but uh, I supported the <coughs> officer's recommendation and the report. Uh, and thank goodness um, that uh, this has been uh, able to take place during this year. Uh, I'm not a member of your committee chair, so I don't have to declare an interest. But I went for my uh, third jab uh, uh, to this site uh, and uh, I, I anticipate perhaps going for a fourth one, just as Mr. Rose said, you know, so that people can um, take pressure off um, our doctors and their surgeries. So I, I would call on, on your committee to, to support this uh, recommendation, Chair. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you, Councillor Ingham. And, and it is so important to have these centres. I believe I had on the Cron um, last week. Um, not very pleasant at all. Uh, Councillor Gazard, no. No, wait a minute, Councillor Young. Is Councillor Young in the meeting, Wendy? Yes, I am. Yeah. Right, you uh, have you, to, um, you nearly forgot me there. <laughs> no, <laughs> oh, only nearly. Um, right, you have five minutes, Jeff. Okay. Uh, good morning, uh, Chair, Officers and, and Committee. Obviously, I support this application and it is vital uh, to the COVID-19 uh, emergency measures. And I thank the staff and owners of Greendale for delivering this facility, facility so quickly. Uh, I just want to explain and provide more information about this location. The whole of this compound uh, was agricultural and agreed landscaped uh, tree cover until 2014 when it was leveled and cleared prior to any planning application. Um, it is a short distance from Windmill Hill, which is a highly significant uh, historic feature as it was the site of a battle during the pre uh, 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 prayer book rebellion. Probably if planning permission had been submitted, agricultural work would have had to be uh, requested prior to any earthworks. Um, the earthworks and construction continued at the applicant's own risk, whilst a planning application was being drafted, although officers requested a halt to these works. It took considerable time for the planning application uh, to materialize, a hybrid application which was refused uh, in uh, July 2016. The owner submitted a further application later that year uh, for a change of use from agriculture and industrial, uh, but again refused. Uh, this subsequently went to the planning inspectorate and was dismissed and was further upheld uh, that year by the High Court. Although the uh, planning inspector required the building and the concrete apron to be removed, the owners requested that the concreted area to be covered uh, with topsoil rather than removed. Uh, as this would give the appearance of open countryside, once the plant planting had grown, it was considered by the planning team that this uh, would be uh, acceptable. Uh, moving on to last year, uh, the temporary inoculation centre at West Point was needing to be moved as the all-important county show was scheduled and the NHS was seeking a suitable site in this locality. Unfortunately, there was no vacant buildings, but the owners of Greendale put forward this speedy solution to help the NHS. The solution was to, to remove the topsoil and provide a new structure rather than a marquee uh, because it was said it would be quicker and more suitable and uh, the use of the area for the car park. East Devon District Council and ward members were kept informed and totally supported the vital emergency uh, temporary solution. In December, further emergency powers was used to provide a new road uh, to the site to help traffic flow on the Sidmouth Road. Again, uh, this council was totally supportive. I have one question regarding the road. As the emergency powers have been uh, extended to the end of the year, um, does the NHS need to submit a planning application now? Uh, on another point, uh, a resident was concerned regarding water runoff uh, during heavy rain from this new road which he believed may affect his property. Uh, this was looked at and confirmed that water runoff uh, would not be significant and there is no danger to his property. Therefore, I support this application, but I would require any subsequent full planning application must be considered against our local plan and villages plan. Thank you. 
Thank you, um, Councillor Young. And it's interesting what you said about the archaeology of the area um, and the history of it. Um, do we know, Mr Rose, whether the county archaeologist was involved in um, previous application? Presumably they would have been advised. Yeah, I don't think that I, I think uh, this site gets very close to where we feel that there could be some archaeology, but it's not under the site itself. Okay, okay. thank you for that. Councillor Gazard. Thank you, Chair. Um, yeah, as, as we all know, we're living in extreme, uh, exceptional times. Um, I, I have no hesitation in recommending approval of this site. And, I, and I'm sure, like everybody else, would like to thank the owners of Greendale for coming forward with this site and the NHS, the volunteers, for providing this ongoing service that we require. So I'd like to move approval, please, Chair. Thank you. Thank second. you, Councillor Gazard. Is there a seconder, please? Uh, I'll, I'll second Lawrence. No, Who right. was that? Woodward. Thank you. Tony, would you like to speak to it? Yes, just briefly. Um, I was heavily involved in coordinating the volunteers mm -hmm. in the district, particularly in Exmouth, uh, where we used the initially the tennis centre and also then uh, after that the le leisure sports centre um, and the surgeries in Exmouth and uh, it was actually an inconvenience to those organisations to um, give up part of their premises. Um, so it, this will actually be the only dedicated um, facility in East Devon. So I, I think we must go with this, but we <laughs> don't have any choice anyway. But I do um, think we should approve it. And therefore, I'm happy to second. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Woodward. And, and I'd like to offer thanks on behalf of everyone, I think, for all the marvellous work the volunteers have done. Uh, it's been invaluable and uh, very efficient. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Desarum. Thank you very much, Chair. Uh, we've heard today from the ward member the, a great history of the site, and I think it is fair to say that we have now been engaged in a new battle uh, to save lives on behalf of the NHS, uh, and that um, the applicant has made a considerable investment on behalf of the NHS, and whilst there's no policy, clear policy support for it, clearly Mr Rose has informed us that it will be going ahead under the emergency rights, um, and I think, as everyone else has said, we, they must be congratulated uh, for, do, for doing their bit to help keep us all healthy and safe. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Right, there are no more hands. Over to you, Mrs Shaw. Sum up, please. Thank you, Chair. You have one motion to recommend approval subject to the condition as set out in the report. When your name is called, please would you indicate whether you're in support of the motion to recommend approval, whether you're against the motion to recommend approval, or whether you're abstaining from the vote. Councillor Bloxham. Support approval. Councillor Brown. Support approval. Councillor Chamberlain. Support approval. Councillor Coleman. Support approval. Councillor Davy. Support approval. Councillor DeSarum. Support approval. Councillor Gazard. Support approval. Councillor Howe. Support. Councillor Key. Approve. Councillor Lawrence. Support approval. Councillor Pratt. Support approval. Councillor Woodward. Support approval. Councillor Rag. Support approval. Thank you. The application is recommended for approval. Thank you, Wendy. Right, we move now to uh, agenda item 11. Uh, applications 21. 1212 variation and 212781 full minor application. Um, and it's on pages 62 to 72. And I'm just looking for the page now. Um, and it is for, is it Skiat or Skeet Cottage in Colleton? Oh, right. Um, and we have the applicant, uh, David Brazendale, and the ward member, Councillor Arnott. Um, so over to you, Mr Rose, to present your report, please. 
Thank you, Chair. Yeah, so this relates to a uh, uh, holiday let cottage uh, that in 1991 was converted to a holiday let from stables. Uh, and there's two applications in front of you and the applications here because the officer recommendations contrary to the, the ward members view. The first application is for a variation of condition to uh, the previous consent on the site to allow the unrestricted use of the property. So no longer be restricted to a holiday let, but to have the uh, unrestricted residential accommodation. And the second application, which in effect is for the same thing, is a change of use of the holiday let to a dwelling. And I'll, I'll mention the, those applications in, in a minute. But you can see the location of the site here. So we, 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 we're, we're down the road here into Colleton, up the road uh, into Whitford. Um, and you can see the property there and here's the aerial so you can see the distance up there to, to Whitford and down here right to the edge of, of Colleton. Uh, and these are the, the cottages that were there that were constructed as part of the conversion of those, uh, those stables. Uh, and here's the road so this is the road up to the site out, out of Colleton uh, and then up you can see the bends lack of footpath lighting uh, and then we get up to the crossroads of sites up to the right and you keep going up the hill uh, and then looking back down the road so you can see the nature of the lanes to get to the site so the main issue you see in the report is whether the property is in an appropriate location for permanent residential occupation having regard to its access to services and facilities you'll note in the report that there's a town council objection they wish to use to say in holiday use uh, they say we shouldn't be allowing a dwelling in the AOMB which is this, near, this is in and they make reference to their Colleton neighbourhood plan, uh, which says that outside built up area boundaries, uh, there's a restricted residential uses only. Uh, the applicant uh, has, has local links according to the application, which is to return or retire to the area uh, and, and, and put that forward as a, a, in favour of their proposal. Uh, and we appreciate that. But of course, we can't control uh, who occupies the unit or how it's used. So. Whilst I appreciate the intentions of the applicant, there wouldn't be anything stopping them uh, letting it out or even selling it should, should planning permission be granted. So I think members have to give uh, limited weight to uh, the, the, the relationship to the applicant. Uh, so the, the, we've got two applications because the first application came in for the variation of condition, uh, which would in effect remove the holiday tie condition from the application. But since the application was submitted, we've had an appeal decision that says that legally you can't go through that format. So you can't vary a condition to an application to remove a holiday tie um, if it's going to uh, result in a uh, open market dwelling. So because legally uh, we couldn't process and support that first application, the applicant submitted the second application here, which then allows the change of use from the holiday let to a dwelling. So the first application, uh, we, can't, we can't legally uh, approve through that route, hence we've got the second application. With regard to that one, uh, the policy position is we've got strategy seven uh, of the local plan that says that in the countryside, there needs to be a policy that supports a proposal. And we've also got uh, a neighborhood plan uh, and there's no neighborhood plan policy support for this. But we go back to policy D8 of the local plan because that allows the conversion of buildings in the countryside to residential uses. But the key here is an assessment of uh, it allows it where they are close to the built up area boundary stroke, close to a range of services and facilities. Uh, but the policy doesn't give any guide on what is a suitable distance, you know, what, what, what is close proximity to a built up area boundary or range of services and facilities. So we have to look at each case uh, on, its, on its merits and, it, and the character of the area and the distances, etc. In this instance, you'll see from the report that we've looked at the access, it assesses the access and the closeness to Colleton. Uh, Whitford uh, is about the same distance in the other direction, but Honey has a, a church and a hall, so that doesn't have the facilities that you'd need for everyday use to minimise the use of the car. We're about 1.3 kilometres here to uh, the town centre of, uh, of Colleton, and as you can see from the photos that I showed, there are, uh, where are we? There we go. There are no there are no footpaths. There's limited lighting. It's quite a steep road in places. There's impeded visibility at some of the corners. There's a lack of verges in some places to step out onto the road. And there are fairly high traffic speeds uh, on part of these roads. There is a bus stop uh, near this junction here in this photo. 
um, about 300 metres away from the site that gives some access to Seaton and Taunton uh, Mondays through to Saturdays. There's also a similar bus that goes to Beer, um, but again, not on Saturdays and Sundays, and neither of those services run of an evening. Uh, and in addition, there's, there's poor access down these lanes to those, to those bus stops. Um, so it's contrary to the neighbourhood plan and the local plan in terms of its distance to those services and facilities and the fact that that, that walk isn't attractive uh, because of the, the nature of the character of the roads there uh, and obviously used by agricultural vehicles and vehicles going elsewhere. There's also the loss of the, the tourism benefit from the holiday use to take into account. Um, so officers uh, are recommending refusal of the application uh, due to the loss of the tourism use as it's outside the built-up area boundary as, and as it's on the basis mainly that it's not close to a range of services and facilities, therefore occupiers of the unit will be reliant on the use of the car because, as I say, walking and cycling is not a safe or an attractive alternative. Uh, so recommended refusal on the basis of contrary to D8 being uh, not close to a range of services and facilities and therefore reliant on the car. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Rose. Right, Mr. Brazendale, welcome to the meeting. You have three minutes to present your case. Chairman, Chairman has Mr. Has Councillor Skinner been brought back into the meeting? Uh, yes, of yes. course I'm here, David. Of course you're here. I'm here. Thank you for your concern. <laughs> yeah. OK, Mr. Brazendale, you have three minutes. Thank you. Good morning. Um, my name is David Brazendale. I own Ski Cottage in Collison. Uh, my application here is simply for a change of use, just to allow me to use my existing cottage as a permanent home of residence when I retire in March. Uh, some quick background on me. I spent the first 25 years of my life in the area. I went to primary school in Seaton and attended Collaring Grammar School. My family originate um, within the Axe Valley and have been here for many generations. Um, I bought the property 14 years ago, and as you can see, it's a cottage on the outskirts of Collison and one of four properties on site. And you'll see from a review of my case that all of my uh, fellow neighbours and homeowners on the site are supportive. They would prefer this to be a uh, permanent residence, both from a kind of community and safety perspective. I'm therefore seeking your support to make this minor change to remove this restriction. Um, I'd really like to emphasise that there are no new development here. This is, the property and the pattern of development already exists, so the sustainability is already covered. I'm just looking for permanent residential use. Planning previously turned this down on the grounds of access and sustainability and a need for a car, and I think there are a couple of pertinent points here. Firstly, there is a regular hourly bus service supporting Seaton, Collerton and Axminster that runs immediately outside the property Monday to Saturday. And using this will help maintain this local service for others, and this bus is hailable from directly outside my cottage, as confirmed again last week with the operator's Axe Valley Mini Travel. Any resident of East Devon would be able to give their right arm for this kind of sustainable and convenient service. And as Mr Rose points out, there's another bus, bus service um, uh, a few hundred metres away that runs from Collerton to Taunton via Honiton. Secondly, Skeet Cottage is, is, is about a kilometre away from Collerton and is easily accessible by pedal or electric cycle or walking and this route is used actively by lots of lots of local cyclists for example the axe valley peddlers and this is a safe road there have been no recorded accidents on this road involving pedestrian or cyclists as confirmed by the highway agency mm. currently holidaymakers using my property can have up to two cars i only have one car so this should positively reduce the environmental impact whilst providing year-round economic benefits to the local community not not just um, around holiday periods. And precedent cases, for example, in, in Farway, in Moncton, and from around East Devon, have also have all been allowed in the same circumstances, but in more extreme and distant locations. And I therefore seek your support. To finish, I just really want to have the opportunity to live in Collerton and make a contribution to the local community. And I hope that having a permanent resident in an existing property supporting the local economy would be the type of application that the council could support. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Mr. Brazendale. Um, now the ward member, Councillor Arnott, please. You have three minutes. Five Thank minutes, sorry, five. I'll try and do three, Chair. Thank you very much. Just a reminder to all members of the committee, you are Chair, not Chairman. Um, so um, this is only the second time I've ever commented on a planning application in, in the last... Uh, 
uh, uh, getting on for three years. Uh, I don't know Mr. Brazendale, and I've never met Mr. Brazendale, but I'm really alarmed by, and I know this went between a number of officers, and I also know it was delayed because of the technicality that, that Mr. Rose uh, 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 spoke about earlier. But given how, may, how much weight has been given to the transport thing, I felt I had to speak because there's such a natural injustice in this report. First of all, like Mr. Brazendale, I, I actually catch the 885 bus from Collerton to Seaton or Collerton to Axminster, where I catch trains to London. It is completely wrong to say that it's not on a sustainable bus route. The bus can be hailed from outside Ski Cottage. And it is. And by sheer coincidence, uh, Mr. Brazendale and I put in exactly the same call to the Axe, Axe Valley Transport people in Seaton to confirm that last week. So that part of the report is simply wrong. And the weight uh, given to that, I think, has to be uh, has to be just ignored. Um, and I don't I'm not criticizing officers for this. I, I know it's gone between officers, but I don't I don't think that's a fair comment on it at all. Uh, there is another bus which you can also catch to Honiton and Taunton. Um, so in terms of our rural countryside, it's unusually well connected. If you then look, um, and I, if Mr Rose is kind enough, uh, come back up to the aerial, to the map, to the Ordnance Survey view, or whatever it is. Um, sorry, that's the chair of the council trying to call me. Um, this, this residence bears absolutely no uh, relevance to Whitford, to the north uh, east there that you can see. None whatsoever. So Whitford is irrelevant to it. Um, it is uh, very close to the centre of Collerton. Now, as Mr Brazendale has said, um, and I know this because I know these people, it, it, is, a, it is a cycling route. The Axe Valley Peddlers, who are a huge organisation around here, go cycling up there perfectly happily. Um, we have friends who cycle to and from Collerton and Whitford to go and play tennis with each other up that road. As long as you're wearing something high-vis, it is perfectly safe. And as Mr Brazendale has said, there's no evidence at all of there actually having been a high number of incidents. I'm very worried about the exaggeration of its remoteness from Collerton. It, it simply isn't. And if you look at it there, um, if I were Mr. Brazendale, I would fearlessly just walk down the hill uh, to, for example, the either where the uh, there's a new cafe by the Unborn Bridge, uh, which is nowhere near 1.3 kilometres away, or to the Kingfisher pub. Um, it is no distance at all. It's a four or five minute walk at the, at the most. So then... Chair, I hope I've tried to, I've tried there to explain that I don't think the transport argument holds at all. Um, I do think we need to listen respect, respectfully to Mr. Brazendale's own account of his own local connections, which, um, and I have spoken to him on the phone, um, I trust implicitly. And of course, as Mr. Rose says, of course he could, you know, one day he could sell it off to somebody else in the future. I don't believe he has any intention of that. I think he's retiring back to the community from which he belonged. I don't think we should lend any weight to that. But finally, Chair, I'm also minded that the planning committee um, only, I think, the middle of last year, gave permission to Councillor Brown and the Moncton Court Hotel uh, for that to have a change of use to private residential. Now, I'm not sure that it went through, and fair enough, but the transport arguments there <laughs> are... Uh, nobody said... Um, how difficult it was to get from there to somewhere else. It's on the A30, for heaven's sake. You wouldn't want to walk or cycle from there. So I think you've already um, put through applications of this sort, and I think you can do so with this one. Um, and then finally, finally, there's an internal uh, lack of logic in this. If it is being argued that you can only get the kilometre to Collerton by getting in a car, for somebody who lives there on a permanent basis, then that's exactly the same for a tourist in that building. They'll still be making that same journey by car. And it's not unlikely, as Mr. Brazendale said, they may have two cars if they're visiting perhaps a couple of families sharing the unit. So I would ask the committee, please, to, to lend no weight at all to the transport problems. There are no problems with that. I think they should 
look at the president as well of uh, Monkson Court Hotel only last year and how the transport uh, 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 things didn't apply to that at all. I think we should respect Mr. Brazendale's uh, wish to come back to the community from where he has his origins. Uh, and I have no doubt um, that he will be a productive member of the community and spend a good deal of money in Collerton Town Centre, uh, which we which we much need. Um, and I'm sorry that his application has been delayed for so long through these various other processes as well. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Councillor Arnott. Um, these sort of anomalies that we've had in the past over holiday accommodation in rural areas, um, we, we really would like those addressed in the upcoming local plan that's being drawn up. And I do hope that um, Councillor Ledger will be watching this or checking on this uh, and will uh, try to address the, the issues that there have been. Right, members, Councillor Key. Yes, thank you, Chair. I'd like, just like to put Councillor Arnott right in actual fact. Uh, Moncton Court was changed from a hotel to a house. So it wasn't a rented property uh, or had a, a, a holiday let on it at all. So just to put him in the picture there. Um, this, I would like to ask Mr. Rose, really, um, is it possible, or would it be possible, that this could be changed to a permanent let rather than a holiday let property? So through you, Chair, so, yeah. so that, that this application would allow that. So when, when, when a use becomes somebody's main property, uh, so not for holiday let, so it's the, their main place of residence, uh, that's when you need consent for um, uh, the open market use that the applicant's applying for. Under the holiday let, somebody couldn't, couldn't move in and live there for six months as their main residence. Have I, have I made that clear? Yes, fine. So, so in actual fact, then, um, I would like to uh, uh, put forward the recommendation of, a, of refusal um, as it stands. Thank you. Thank you. Is there a seconder for that, please? I'll second that, please. Sorry, was that Councillor Skinner? No, it's Councillor Brown. Councillor Brown. Would you like to speak on it, Councillor Brown? Um, well, I will do the same as my name was mentioned. Um, there's a big difference between this one and Monkson Court, which was approved. Um, this one already had living accommodation with it, with the exception that it had rooms it could let out. So living accommodation was also already there. Um, and the biggest difference is Monkson Court was written up for approval. This is written up for refusal um, on, on the correct grounds. Thank you. Thank you. I think the point that Councillor Arnott was speaking was um, about public transport. Um, right, Councillor Skinner. We're, we're, we've got public transport. We have regular bus service into yes, town, that's, that's, which is only one mile away. Yes, that's the point I was making, in that there's an hourly bus service um, that runs by this property. Um, Councillor Skinner, please. Uh, yes, thank you, Chair. And, and I now understand why Councillor Key was wondering if I'd been brought back in, because I've, I've got my video on, but I seem to be in the black. Am I in the black with everybody else? Yeah, you you're, yes, you are. Oh, yeah. I, I, I don't know how that works then, because I, I've got my video on and I am just seem to be in the black. Anyway, I'll let the powers to be who, who hopefully perhaps one day you may be able to, I don't know what you do or let me in or let me out or whatever it is, but uh, whatever. But anyway, you've got my voice, so I'll, I'll, I'll keep cracking on. Um, yes, I, I, I sort of uh, have a certain amount of sympathy with um, Councillor Arnott and, and the applicant and the way they've said what they've said. And I think some of the things is, is, is some of these things. We have our policies and then we have what, what, what is sometimes very often a sort of a common sense approach. And when you get a line of four um, bungalows or four dwellings there, and I don't know if Mr. Rose, if you could go to where the car was parked outside, where the, the, that, that's it, that's the one now. Within this report, it says that two of them are 
for you know permanent um, residents, and then there's there's two sort of holiday dwellings. And it tends to say to yourself, they were probably holiday d- dwellings for for a part for whatever a moment in time when that play took place. And they, Mr. Brazen Dale, who who owns it, um, is wanting to come back and live there. And when you have a block of four like that, does it really make a lot of sense that it stands up that you say, well, two or one, and two is another, and you're going to try and put some argument that says why two shouldn't be on some sort of technicality on that does the bus pass and all this sort of nonsense rain rain the lanes uh, uh, or whether they don't so in my own conscience in my mind i think the way councillor arnott has put over his case he's absolutely right that's that's my view that's where i sit the only thing that's a caveat to that is that when council uh, mr brazendale and council arnott speak about other applications that we had If there's one thing I will always hold dear to my heart with us as a planning authority and a planning committee is that each application is taken on its own merit. And when you start saying what happened over here and happened over here, well, we take those applications on their own merit. And if there were cases when we overruled particular applications, no could say we just passed it, there would have been mitigating circumstances why we would have allowed and gone against our already existing policies. Otherwise, there's no point having these policies if we're just going to ride over them all the time. So there's mitigating sense of circumstances and those applications just to take them out of the blue is not either not really quite fair. But I think one of the things where I sit with this report and I've read it through, and I think if we want to look at the executive summary, and I may just, if you just indulge with me for a moment, Chair, because I think it's a very relevant point uh, within, within this report, having said all what I've said about where I am, there's our policies and there's planning law. And it goes on to say both applications seek the same outcome, and it's the second uh, sentence, namely the ability to occupy skirt skirt cottage as a permanent residence. The first application which seeks to remove the condition limiting the use to holiday accommodation cannot be approved because the resulting unrestricted use would conflict with the description of the development, which case law has found to be unlawful. Therefore, planning law being the same as civil law, we would actually be going against planning law by allowing this application. So this is one of those applications whereby I very rarely do this, as you, um, Chair, would know, and, and, and committee members. I'm just going to sit out on this one and hear the debate from each way or the other. And I'm waiting for other people to convince me which way I need to vote one way or the other, because I'm conflicted. My common sense approach says that this is really quite allowable. Why isn't it? When we have the comparisons of the, one that's, the other ones that are in the line. But the planning law says that we shouldn't allow it. So I'd need somebody to come along and give me some reason through the planning law process that we would allow this. So in other words, my mind is saying, I'd like to see this passed. Give me the reasons how and why we're going to do it. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Skinner. Um, Yeah, I'm somewhat conflicted on this one because I would have thought that a permanent resident uh, would be far more beneficial to the economy of the area than um, than holiday makers who vacate the place. So a um, bit, bit bemused by that one. Um, right, Councillor Desarum. Thank you, Chair. Yes, I think the ward member did make some very uh, compelling issues, raised some very compelling issues, uh, particularly about the 885 bus. But I, I am conflicted, as Councillor Skinner said, because in our report it said that there is no evidence that it operates a hail and ride service, but even if it did, the limitations of the service wouldn't make it a convenient alternative to the car. So I'm, I'm very concerned about the way the report phrased that. And also, again, at page 64, uh, the point to the parish council did not support the provision of a new dwelling in the countryside and which is part of the AONB. Now, we obviously asked the parish council for their comments because we are sometimes and, and in many cases guided by what a parish council says. So I am, I am a little concerned on those two points. The fact that, yes, we know that there is a bus service, but it would appear to be very limited. And secondly, the parish council were not very much in support. So that, that's why I, I, I still have very concerns about what was raised. Uh, thank you very much, Chair. Thank you. Well, I, I think an hourly bus service in a rural area is quite good when you, you get some that are only once a week. So, um, Councillor Davy. 
Thank you, Chair. Um, yeah, it's been an interesting debate. Um, I'm always on the, the lookout for the kind of Trojan horse of um, conversions of holiday lets from agricultural buildings, which uh, subsequently are turned into homes. But I think in this case, there are some mitigating circumstances. And I think it's a bit of a tricky one. You, you buy a home perhaps thinking, well, you know, that will make a nice little retirement place for me when I'm ready. And you let it out um, in the meantime and then find that you can't change it back um, when when you apply for change of use. Um, and I think I think we have to defer to local knowledge here that in fact the uh, location is relatively sustainable. I mean 1.3 kilometers I don't regard as a very long way personally either to walk or cycle. Um, and I think there's some fairly compelling evidence that the lane is used quite regularly by cyclists and hopefully motorists would, would be aware of that. Um, and, um, and similarly by pedestrians. I, I accept it's probably not an ideal location, but I do think uh, there is some argument that this is not an unsustainable location. Um, and again, I think we're going to have to review this when it comes to our strategic um, plan, um, the local plan revision, um, to consider the use of electric cars, um, which potentially at least um, can be much more sustainable, whether there'll be a change in government legislation in the national planning policy framework, I don't know. Um, but um, I must say at the moment, I'm minded to support this, and I do bear in mind what Mr. Rose is saying that once we allow this, there's no guarantee that it will actually be used as a retirement home and somebody else could live there. But I, I still rather accept that it's in a relatively sustainable location and, and relatively close to a, a range of accessible um, services. Thank you. Thank you. Could I ask, what does he support? What, what does he mean by support? Just I'm asking a question. Is it, does he support the refusal or does he support? No, he, he's supporting approval. Oh, he didn't say that. That's all. Uh, oh, okay. okay. Thank you. Just just to confirm that, Chair, yes, through you, um, I do uh, support approval of mm. this. Thank you. Because Thank you of the sustainability, that. partly. Yeah. Okay, Councillor Howe. Thank you. I think we all need to listen to Mr Rose and particularly on... The first one, 211213 slash VAR, um, because we have to refuse that. We've got no choice. It would be quite wrong. And it, I, I think Shirley needs to make a comment along with Mr. Rose as to the legality of allowing that. So that moves us to the second one then, which then possibly is up for debate. I actually have a fair bit of sympathy with this um, because of what has been said by Mr. Rose. Uh, not Mr. Rose, sorry. Uh, Councillor Arnott, but, and I do need to correct Councillor Arnott, because he mentioned on the good character of the uh, the owner, and that he, you know, he assures, well, we don't grant permission to a person, we grant permission on the land. So irrespective of the owner, it's got nothing to do with the planning permission. Um, believe me, there are lots of times when we would like to consider the owner, but nevertheless, we can't. Um, so we are allowing a home in the countryside. It's already built. It's a holiday cottage currently. We're changing the holiday cottage to a home. Um, and I must admit at that point, with what Councillor Arnott said about the transport, I'm beginning to waver possibly in favour. But, you know, I'm yet to be decided. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Howe. And from memory, I think very often, um, family situations are taken into account, um, particularly keeping young families in the countryside when extra accommodation is needed. So that has been considered in the past. Uh, Councillor Gassard. Chair, if I could, that's for agricultural purposes, nothing else. Yeah, OK, thank you. Councillor Gassard. Thank you, Chair. Um, I'm speaking in support of the second application for a permanent term residency um, and, and and these are just uh, my, my views um, the buildings are already there as far as I can see mm -hmm. and I, I, I my personal view is that I, I think it would be better if the 
buildings were um, in occupation uh, all year round rather than on a um, ad hoc basis for, for tourists. Uh, I take the comments and I agree with the comments that there is um, an hourly bus service. Um, I live in Exmouth and where I live, just on the outskirts in Withicombe, I have a, an hourly bus service. So, you know, um, I, I can walk into town as, as this um, applicant or applicants can walk into Colleton. And there is, there's room for cars there. And as has been stated already, there, are, there can be space for two cars. It will be cut back to, to one, as I understand it. And surely that's going to help with our carbon reduction issues. So um, that, that's a bonus if it's just going to be one car rather than two cars. And I, and I think he, the request is, is a valid one and uh, it, it is sustainable. So um, I wish to support the chair. Thank you. Councillor Woodward. Thank you, Chair. Yes, um, uh, with regard to uh, Councillor Davies' comments about um, it being sustainable, I agree with that. So I uh, agree with his comments and uh, also with Councillor Skinner's comments about it being a block of four and the buildings are already there. Um, it seems rather odd to say that one of them can't be also residential. Um, and I think the point he's making about the unlawful is um, covered by um, the uh, application, the second application. Um, and I'm uh, proposing um, approval of the second application on those bases that it's sustainable. And uh, the, uh, the fact that it would be permanent well, for unrestricted residential would be probably advantageous over a holiday that in this particular site. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Councillor Woodward. Councillor Lawrence. Thank you, Chair. Um, yeah, I'm a little bit torn on this one because I think we have to respect the policies that um, Mr Rose and, 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 and the officers are working to. Because if you look at this, um, first of all, the Town Council object to it. Um, the newly um, issued Colleton Neighbourhood Plan um, it goes against five of the policies in that. It goes against six of the adopted East Devon local plan, the one we're using at the moment. Um, six strategies, it goes against those. It goes against government planning documents, um, the, the, the national planning policy framework and, and planning practice guidance. And I just wonder how many of these things we can overlook um, in order to, to proceed with this on, on a, on a favourable basis. Um, it, it seems to me that the officers are quite correct in what they're saying because they're, they're following these strategies. If these strategies are wrong, then we, we've got to change them. But I do agree that it's probably better to have the cottage occupied all year round rather than just a holiday cottage. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Lawrence. Now, <clears throat> uh, I believe there's a question um, that Mrs Shaw would like to ask the proposer and seconder. Mrs Shaw? I think Mrs Shaw's having technical issues at the moment, Chair. Oh dear. Um, well then I'll ask instead um, to the proposer and the seconder, uh, that is Councillor Key and Councillor Brown. Um, are you proposing refusal for both or, I think we should take them separately actually. Are you proposing refusal for both? Um, are you proposing refusal for the variation of condition one on 071771 variation? Can you reply, what, please? What what I would what I would like to say is I, I mentioned nothing about sustainability because I mean I read through that there was I knew that there was bus services there. Yeah. So yeah. I've not criticised that in one way. What I did put forward to Mr. Rose was the fact that could the holiday let be changed to a permanent let? And Mr. Well, that, Rose said, yes, it could. Yes, that's, that's what the second application is for. So are you recommending refusal on the first application, the variation, and approval on the full application? No, I'm, I'm, the I'm, holiday 
cottage to unrestricted residential dwelling? No. No, no. I'm, 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 putting, I'm putting forward in actual fact that um, the, uh, to allow the building to be used as unrestricted dwelling Thank you. Is, is not a problem as long right. as it is a rental problem, a rental property. I don't know that that could could you explain the legal situation there, Mr. Rose, as Mrs. Shaw's not here? I, I'm not sure that that can be done, can it? No, you're quite right, Chair. We can't insist that it be rented no. only. It's it's either an open market dwelling and somebody can live in it or rent it out permanently or or it's the holiday let. Thank you. So, so it can't it can't be changed then to no. a permanent let dwelling rather than a holiday let no no we no we can't do that councillor key it's, it's either a, an open market dwelling and the owner has the opportunity to live in it or to rent it out long term or it's a holiday let or sell it i presume or, or sell it yes yeah but due to his close links with the area it does seem quite convincing that he wants to live in it himself um so on that, are you happy to support or propose that that is approved, the second one? Uh, From a holiday cottage to um, unrestricted residential dwelling. Oh, no, I'm, I'm, I'm not. No, 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 no because well, it it doesn't comply to policy, unfortunately. It's a shame, but it doesn't apply to policy. And it hasn't got the backing of the parish council. Right. Um, Councillor Key, do you still want to put that forward as uh, an unrestricted residential dwelling? And if so, is there a second there? No, I still want, I still want to stand by the, my original uh, of, um, or recommendation of refusal on both. Thank you. Oh, right. Refusal on both then. OK. And that's seconded by Councillor Brown. Right. Now we know where we are then. Uh, Councillor Pratt. Yes. Thank you, Chair. Um, dealing solely with the second uh, application, that is the change of use for an unrestricted residential dwelling, the evidence that we have heard from Mr... Brazendale is that there is an hourly bus service which runs past the house but which can be used on the basis of a hail and ride service. That plus the fact that uh, a, a, a sort of bicycle um, use um, to um, the, uh, the town of Collerton is certainly reasonable and if for that reason alone I would suggest that this application, that is the second application, is uh, I would I would support approval of that that one. Um, I don't know whether anyone has uh, proposed approval of. Uh, no, you that. can't do that. It's a direct negative. You can vote against the recommendation. Oh, a vote vote against the recommendation. You're quite yeah. right, Chair. Sorry. Okay, that's yes. okay. Um, right, over to Mrs. Brown then. Mrs. Oh, God, dear. It's going to be a long day. Uh, over to Mrs. Shaw. Sorry, Mrs. I didn't mean to barry off to Mr. Uh, Councillor Brown. Um, it's Amanda, Chair. Um, Shirley is just joining the meeting. OK. I gather she's having technical problems. Just to fill in time. In just to... Just to fill in time, Chair, I've got I've got over my issue of black. I did the switch of cameras. I got at the back, so it was my fault. Sorry, Wendy. Oh, it's okay because um, Mrs. Shaw had a similar problem. I think. <laughs> yeah, it's <laughs> what you call over not being you, very Mrs. Bright. Shaw, are you with us? It's a bit like a séance, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I can hear you, but I can't see you. Is there anybody there? <laughs> Over to you, Mrs. Shaw. Mrs. Shaw's, um, she's in the meeting, but she's having trouble being heard. Um, so bear can I, with... Can you hear me oh. now? 
Yeah. Oh. Yes, I'm yes. Lovely. <laughs> Lovely. Now, I understand him whilst I was out, and please correct me if I'm wrong, that uh, the both the variation application and the full application have been moved and seconded for refusal for the reasons. Yes, they have. Yes, they Thank have. you very much. If we members, if we could take the variation application first, uh, so therefore we'll be taking two votes. So the motion is to recommend refusal for the reasons as set out in the report. When your name is called, please would you indicate whether you support the motion to recommend refusal, whether you're against the motion to recommend refusal, or whether you're abstaining from the vote. Councillor Bloxham. I'll support refusal on the variation. Thank you. Councillor Brown. Sorry, Councillor support Brown. refusal. Support refusal. Yes. Councillor Chamberlain. Support refusal. Thank you. Councillor Coleman's left the meeting, so I move to Councillor Davy. Support refusal. Councillor Desaron. Support refusal. Councillor Gazard. Support refusal. Councillor Howe. Refuse. Councillor Key. Refuse. Councillor Lawrence. Support refusal. Sorry, just going back. When you say refuse, you're, you're supporting refusal. Um, yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Um, okay, so Councillor Lawrence was supporting refusal. Uh, Councillor Pratt. Supporting refusal. Councillor Skinner. Refuse. Against. Thank you. Councillor Woodward. Support refusal. Councillor Rag. Support refusal. Thank you. So that's recommended for refusal. Thank you, members. So if we could now move on to the full application, that was 212781. The motion is to recommend refusal for the reasons as set out in the report. Please, would you indicate when your name is called whether you support the motion to recommend refusal, whether you're against the motion to recommend refusal, or you're abstaining from the vote? Councillor Bloxham. Against refusal. Councillor Brown. Support refusal. Councillor Chamberlain. Support refusal. Councillor Davy. Against refusal. Councillor Desaron. Support motion to recommend refusal for the reasons as clearly set out in the report. Councillor Gazard. Against refusal. Councillor Howe. Refuse. Against refusal. Uh, no, I'm going with the refusal. Oh, sorry. Thank you. Thank you. <coughs> um, Councillor Key. Support refusal. Thank you. Councillor Lawrence. Support refusal. Councillor Pratt. Against refusal. Thank you. Councillor Skinner. Support refusal. Councillor Woodward. Against refusal. Councillor Rag. Against refusal. Okay, just let me total up. So it's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven in support of refusal and one, two, three, four, five, six against. So that is recommended for refusal. Do I get a casting vote? No, it's seven, six. No, it's seven, only six. when it's, a, it's so. a split vote. <laughs> That's what I thought. Not unless you want to fiddle the accounts. <clears throat> Do that, you know I want to. Ah. Right. Oh, that's my script. Right, members. Um, then we go on to agenda item 14. It's for Middle Hill House, Church Hill, Honiton. Um, Chair, but, Chair, can yeah. I just interrupt just for a second? I do apologise. Um, could I get a steer as to when the two Fenerton applications are coming up? Because I understood they were items number seven and eight. Yeah, they've been jiggled around a bit. Um, ah. So I'm in uh, a bit of a quandary for later on that I won't be able to, be able to speak. Comes, uh, we've got we've got this one 
another one, another one. So we've got three before the Fenerton one. Oh, that's yeah, going to put me out from being able to speak, I'm afraid, Chair. Oh, um, well. There's, there's only one that I would like to speak on, really, and that is the, um, the, the Goldcomb application. But basically, it's the same as what you've just had in terms of a let being turned into a permanent dwelling. Okay. Um, well, can we take that one now so that you're able to speak then? I'd very much appreciate that. Is that okay that. Yeah. with, with uh, officers? So the, the problem is, uh, Eileen, uh, Councillor Rag, is I don't think we've got the applicant agent here. Ah, uh, that's... The other speaker. And well, it knocks me out for time as well, Eileen. Phil Twist here as well. I've been hanging on for this as well. Okay. Um, well, we, we've got to wait for the applicant. So... Um, We'll proceed as we were doing then. Um, would, it be possible then would it be possible sorry? then, Chair, for Wendy to ping me? Because um, I'm, I'm, I have to be would. outside. To Is that okay with you, Wendy? Uh, yes, or Councillor Bruce can forward me something that he would like me to read out on his behalf. Yes. Yeah. Um, yes, I could do that. Yes. Yes, I'll do that, Chair, if that's okay. Okay, thank you, Councillor Bruce. No, I, so I'll send it uh, direct to Wendy. Yeah, I, I'm sorry about that. No, there's um, no problem. Thank you, Chair. Okay. Uh, right, agenda item 14, application 212641, full application, Middle Hill House, Church Hill, Honiton, uh, pages 92 to 106. Um, and welcome to the meeting, Matthew Daltamarum. And um, Councillor Twist, board member. Thank you. Over to Mr. Rose, please. Thank you, Chair. So, yeah, so this relates to uh, Middle Hill House, uh, outskirts of Honiton. So you can see the location on the on the screen here, and it's before you because the officer uh, recommendation is contrary to the view of one of the ward members. And it's demolition of a, a barn that's on the site and construction of a replacement dwelling. Members may recall this site uh, from February last year, where we had a planning application in to convert this uh, building to a dwelling that was approved. And it was approved on the basis that it's right next to the built up area boundary for Honiton and therefore was considered to be in a sustainable location in, in accordance with policy. Yeah. So we've now got an application rather than conversion of the building to demolish it and to, to build a, a new building. Um, so you can see the, the location here, there's an access comes in through the property to the building uh, at the rear. These are the existing ground floors, so store workshop. Uh, these are the uh, existing elevations uh, of the building. And then we get the proposed layout. So it, it's kept a very similar footprint to the existing building, but, but uh, residential layout. And we have a similar design of, of building proposed. The main difference being a slight increase in the pitch and the height of the roof. But other than that, uh, similar in appearance to the scheme that was previously approved, which is this one in front of you here. So very similar in terms of its, its appearance, access down the side of this property through to the back. And there is the, the building itself. So as I say, in the garden to Middle Hill House, it's a, a barn in the paddock. Uh, there's also a, a grade two church, a two star listed church in the, in the background. We're in the uh, AOMB, as I say, just outside the built-up area boundary, um, and uh, it's to replace. So rather than convert this building, which has already been granted, it's now to replace it with a similar-looking building with, with, a, with, a, with a slightly higher-pitched roof. We're 75 metres to the built-up area boundary, and we just had a debate on policy D8, uh, which allows conversions of buildings to uh, residential where it's well-located close to a built-up area boundary, hence the uh, a grant of consent back in February uh, last year for the conversion of this building. Uh, but there's no policy in the local plan that supports new build in the countryside, hence this, this uh, proposal has come forward as a, as a, as a departure. But obviously the applicant here has a fallback position of being able to convert the building to get that residential use. Yeah. And you'll see from the report that we've gone through and assessed and we can't find any additional harm from the new build rather than converting the building. Uh, um, and uh, uh, even though there's going to be an increase in the in the height of the ridge of the building by approximately a metre, it's not going to have any wider the visual harm on the area. 
the materials are appropriate and as before and despite it being in the AOMB the site is is well screened with no wider public views so in terms of the design and the change uh, no no greater impact than the conversion of the building uh, and again, accessibility right next to the built up area boundary, walk or cycle to all those services and facilities within uh, Honiton. No, again, no harm to trees on the site because it's replacing this building on a virtually identical uh, footprint. And for the same reason, no harm to the setting of the church uh, to the rear. And the access is also as previously approved and no harm to the amenity of neighbours. So Despite it being a new build rather than a conversion, there's no 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 uh, worse or any greater harm to the proposal for a new build than there is to conversion of the building, even though the ridge is going to be raised slightly. So on that basis and the basis of the fallback position for the applicant, this one's recommended for approval. Thank you. Thank you. And this puts me in mind of um, something we had at Southern End where we gave permission for a conversion and then the old building fell down. So they had to build a new one. Um, or at least they came back and asked and we granted that. So, um, right, Mr. Dalton Aram, the agent, you have three minutes to speak. Welcome to the meeting. Okay, thank you, Chair. We're thankful for the uh, support for the proposal and would concur with the report's assessment. While the site <laughs> is outside of the built up area boundary of Honiton, it is immediately at the southern edge of the settlement in relatively easy walking distance and cycling distance of the range of services and facilities and public transport options in the town. The recent approval demonstrates that the building is capable of conversion without substantial alteration, reconstruction, um, and is of a sufficient size and scale to form a new dwelling without the need to it for it to be extended. Consequently, as Mr. Rose has indicated, the proposal uh, represents a fallback position that is relevant to this application, um, which seeks to demolish the existing structure and place it with a new building. The existing approval would require the building's uh, structure to be retained. Uh, this places restrictions on how the building can be converted to achieve the necessary building regulation requirements in terms of thermal and energy performance. Uh, while the existing approval can achieve these standards, a new build development would be able to achieve a high, higher standard of design they include sustainable construction methods. A new build would also achieve higher levels of insulation than the proposed scheme, um, and it would allow the use of an air source heat pump rather than being reliant on fossil fuels for heating. The air source heat pump would be able to uh, operate more efficiently in a new airtight building rather than converting into construction. Um, the new build would be more resilient to the impacts of climate change over the longer term than the conversion of the existing former chicken shed. Um, and we would concur with the officer's assessment that although the building would be slightly wider and higher than approved uh, to accommodate a steeper pitch to allow the use of natural slates, overall the scale of the building remains similar to that previously approved. Turning to other matters, the site is within the Blackdown Hills AOMB and within close proximity to the East Devon AOMB, further to the south. It's also adjacent the Grade 2 Star listed Church of St Michael's and All Angels. However, as with the previous scheme, the proposal would be well integrated to its site and relatively close um, to existing buildings and dwellings at Middle Hill House. The building siting in close proximity to these existing dwellings reduces its visual impact um, within the surrounding landscape and ensures that it will be read and set against this context. To further harmonise the building with the surrounding landscape, it is proposed to provide additional landscaping around the building. And as with the previous scheme, the building would be accessed via a track from Middle Hill House's existing entrance, which is considered safe and satisfactory for its use uh, by an additional dwelling. Finally, it's considered there is a sufficient distance of separation between the proposed dwelling and nearby dwellings to ensure that no adverse amenity, amenity impacts would arise from the proposal. Uh, we would therefore respectfully request that members recommend the application be approved. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, right, board member. Councilor good morning, Bitt. Aline. Good morning, members. Morning, morning, mem morning. Members of the public, etc., and the world. Um, hopefully, this will be one of the easier ones you've got to decide on today. The scene's been set by both Mr. Rose and by uh, the agent as well. Um, 
Mr Rose did say that it's here today before you because one of the ward members objected, which isn't quite so. Um, I've, I've just looked at the application and Councillor Jake Bonetta did say, although I object to the renovation taking place altogether due to its position within the Blackdowns A and B and outside the Honours and BUAB boundaries, I am willing to support the application on the basis that approval was given in 2020 for similar plans. So I read that as there being no objection by the ward members. Anyway, uh, that's my little preamble. Uh, we've actually heard much of, um, of, of, of what's going to happen or is proposed to happen on this site. I'm a fierce defender of, of, of the AONB, and I certainly would not be um, supporting this application if I thought there was going to be any significant harm actually to the Blackdowns AONB. I don't consider that there will be. The site is actually in... in in, um, in all reality, in a highly sustainable location. When you relate it to other developments that are taking place um, in, in and around the, the, the town itself. In fact, it's a five minute walk downhill, admittedly, but an eight minute walk uphill to the railway station. There's a bus stop just down the road. There's a bus service pretty well every half an hour to go around the town, so there's no issue with that. And something I find, although not, not directly related to this application, but interesting, in terms of sustainability, which causes this committee angst on every time it every time it meets, it strikes me is the inconsistencies in law. Um, I, I sat for four years on the Devon County Council the School Transport Appeals Committee, where it is legislation, as Eileen will know, she sat on DCC as well, that is acceptable legislation for your child, accompanied by an adult to walk three miles, up to mm -hmm. three miles to school. So mm -hmm. reflecting back on the previous application, if that was a school transport appeal, it would be allowed, um, so, sorry, it would be re refused because it's acceptable for that child to walk three miles and therefore regarded as being in a safe and sustainable location. Totally crazy, completely bonkers. The planning uh, system needs overhauling. I support this application and I hope members do as well. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Councillor Twist. Uh, yes, you're quite right about the school transport appeals. I've walked many a mile, ended up in a ditch at one point. Um, That's the trouble with gin in the morning, Eileen, if, if no, I might suggest. No. <laughs> no, but Boris Johnson wasn't there in the ditch. Um, <laughs> Councillor Skinner. Uh, yes, I, 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 um, I'm just going to support this application. I don't think much more needs to be said. I will just correct um, uh, Councillor Twist. The reason why it's come is not because uh, Councillor Bonetta objected, but you might see that your fellow colleague, Conservative colleague Mike Allen, objected to the application. That's why the application has come forward. That just puts that to bed. Um, but as far as this application is concerned, I see no harm. It's, it's been really that we are where we are, and, and I'm going to just go along. I want to go with the recommendations. Chair, I'm not going to say any more. Uh, I'm happy I'm, to I'm, second it. Okay, thank you. Would you like to speak on it? Councillor, I just, I just, just say it ticks five boxes. It's capable of conversion. The size and scale is possible to form a new dwelling. It has a higher standard, it will have a higher standard design insulation. It has an air heat source heat pump, which is very effective. And there is a degree of separation. So those are my five reasons for recommending this should be approved as per the recommendation before us. Thank you, Thank Chair. you. Councillor Woodward. Thank you, Chair. Well, we, we've got the fallback position, so it's whether we have this um, inefficient building or could we have a much better building which would be better for climate change. So I think we should uh, go with the approval of the application. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, over to you, Mr Shaw. Thank you. If you can still hear me. <laughs> <laughs> Members, the motion is to approve subject to the conditions as set out in the report. When your name is called, please would you indicate whether you support the motion to recommend approval, whether you're against the motion to recommend approval, or whether you're abstaining from the vote. Thank you. It's Councillor Bloxham. Support approval. Councillor Brown. Support. Councillor Chamberlain. Support. Councillor Davy. Support approval. Councillor Tesserum. Support approval. Councillor Gazard. Support. How? Support. Councillor Key. Support. Councillor Lawrence. Support approval. Councillor Pratt. Support. 
Councillor Skinner. Support. Thank you. Councillor Woodward. Support approval. Councillor Rag. Support approval. Thank you. That one is recommended for approval. Thank you. That takes us to agenda item. Item A. Thank you, Councillor Dwiss. Uh, application 212869, full application, minor, land west, west of Burnside, Gamble Lake, Axminster, pages 25 to 34. Uh, I'd like to welcome Councillors Moulding and Jackson. Uh, over to you, Mr Rose, to present your report. Thank you, Chair. Yeah, so this, uh, this application relates to a, a site on Gamble Lake Road in Axminster. Uh, you can see on the screen there, so it's a reserve matters uh, application uh, mm. considering matters of the access appearance, landscaping, layout and scale. So all of the details for four dwellings on the site. Uh, it's before you because there was a, a ward member objection and town council concerns. Uh, and members may recall uh, outline or some members may recall that there was outline consent granted here back in committee in uh, 2018, I think it was. So outline has already been granted on this site for four dwellings. Uh, so this is the this is the extent of the site that was granted outline consent. Uh, it wasn't. Uh, and this is a large car park that was formerly part of Axminster carpets. The site slopes down, as you'll see from the photos, and they realise that the, the, the reason the boundary to the application site for the dwellings was drawn there is because the remainder of the site is in a, in a flood zone. Uh, so then we get the four dwellings proposed on the site, continuing along the, uh, the, the street line there, and you'll see from the photos there's semi-detached properties here. And they're proposing uh, semi-detached properties with a residential frontage, parking to the front uh, of each property and then small gardens to the to the side and rear. And in elevation form, the, the dwellings look like uh, look like so. Uh, and then we've got the street scene here so you can see how it tries to mirror the uh, adjoining properties. And you can see from this the slope down uh, the site to the to the carpet site. Um, so this is the site off here to the to the left. So you can see the properties uh, along here at the moment that it's mirroring the design of and the uh, and it's mirroring the frontage. And there you can see the site going back down into the Axminster carpet site and wider views from the street scene. So you can see that it's it's residential in character along here. So the site cuts across this area here. Uh, and as I say, the bit where the photo stood is in the flood zone. But we are in the uh, built up area boundary. Uh, for uh, Axminster, hence the outline consent being granted uh, back a couple of years ago, and two pairs of semi-detached properties match the character of the area. And you can see from the photos, it's a mixed area. They're mainly semi-detached properties, but some uh, detached, couple of detached properties uh, opposite. As I say, follows the building lines. It's got some rear gardens. It keeps it out of the flood zone, and there's two parking spaces for each of the dwellings. With regard to the scale and appearance, it matches the area, matches the adjoining sites, uh, as do the materials in terms of render and the, the, the tiled roofs. Uh, there's access points off the highway, as I mentioned, uh, for two uh, parking spaces for each dwelling in accordance with our, our, our policies. There's limited opportunity for landscaping, but there is an opportunity to put hedge planting into the front here to divide up those, uh, divide up those parking spaces, and that can be, that can be conditioned. Uh, and there's fencing proposed to the side and rear of the site. Um, the, the town council's comments uh, mention a lack of supported information uh, about uh, drainage, uh, a mention of an environmental study, design and access statement and green energy. Uh, and I'll run through those. We have liaised with the applicant on those. Uh, and the question is, is the lack of that information critical at this stage or can we determine and condition those matters? So with regard to drainage, this is a, a, a small scheme and the site is already fully hard surface. So uh, the applicants can be put in permeable, permeable parking spaces to the front and around the site and grass to the gardens. Uh, foul will link in with the existing foul drainage and we can have a condition to ensure that the surface water mm -hmm. runoff is, is dealt with on site. The town council mentioned this need for an environmental impact study. I, I, I'm not sure what they mean by that. Um, if, if they relate to contamination, which it might do, then there's a condition on the outline that, that, that covers contamination. 
They mentioned that there's not a, a DNA should have been required design and access statement, but that's not a requirement uh, in legislation for reserve matters application. And the final point, they, they say that there should be uh, some higher green energy credentials to these buildings. Uh, they think it's going to comply with uh, the building regs, but there's no, as members be aware, there's no policy in the local plan that we can insist on uh, providing a, a, a greater level of green energy or sustainability uh, at this moment in time. Uh, but finally, we can remove permitted development rights uh, because there are small gardens or uh, adequate gardens, but small gardens. So we mm -hmm. don't think they should be covered by buildings. So in light of that and the grant of the outline, it following the character of the area, the application is recommended uh, for approval. Just one error that I think Councillor Jackson kindly drew to our attention in the first condition uh, under the references there of the things being uh, discharged and approved. Layout is mentioned twice and uh, one of those layouts should be replaced by the word access. Um, but other than that, the application is recommended for approval. Thank you. Chair, Thanks. could I just interject? Could, could I just say something for a moment? I've just realised um, that the applicant was my previous employer. So can I be excused from, from this debate and I won't vote on it? Yeah, who, who was that speaking then, please? Richard Lawrence. OK, thank you, Richard. Yeah. Um, thank you. Right, go to the ward members. Councillor Jackson, please. Uh, bear with me just a tick. Lovely, thank you. Um, okay, so having reviewed uh, the officer report, I note the comments made with regards to ironing out the outstanding issues from the approved outline planning permission by way of conditioning this reserve matters application. Um, however, I'm uncomfortable with this approach um, as I fear it undermines the purpose of the need for having a reserved matters application in the first place. It also means that consultees and the committee do not get the opportunity to consider any subsequent submissions made in response to the condition set in the same way that they would have had the proposed approach been submitted as part of the reserved matters application itself. Let me be clear, I'm particularly, am I particularly concerned with this application in this specific location? No, not especially. Um, it's for a small number of Ilford infill dwellings, a good use of space and reasonably uncontentious location, which should make it um, uh, should make it uh, easier submitting uh, a plan for the areas that are yet to be addressed um, and should be too much of an issue for the applicant. Um, I'm also confident that planning officers would be perfectly able to professionally assess any submissions and work with the applicant to ensure that the approach is appropriate and, se and sensitive to the surrounding estate. This is something that they would ordinarily do prior to an application filing its way <coughs> to you all. However, officers and members don't always agree. Um, and so I'm uncomfortable with this approach to reserved matters applications in general. Um, it could set a dangerous precedent for larger or more contentious developments which follow on from approval of outline or major outline applications. I would respectfully caution the committee against this becoming East Devon District Council's standard approach to reserved applications as it strikes me as undemocratic. I encourage the committee to retain their ability to cri critically and objectively consider the and assess proposals put forwards where disagreements do arise between officers and consultees. If the committee does feel that approval at this stage is a bridge too far, then I would indeed, and that it would indeed erode the democratic process, perhaps the committee might consider deferring their decision to give the applicant an opportunity to submit some more properly formulated plans um, for all of the outstanding matters. Um, thank you very much. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> now, as you've um, made those points uh, about um, discussions, negotiations, conditions with officers, uh, I'd like to give Mr. Rose the opportunity to respond and perhaps add clarification. Mr. Rose. Yeah, I think un unfortunately the, the the legislation doesn't uh, isn't written in in the way that Councillor Jackson might like it to. Uh, that there's a minimum the applicant can put in with an application, and you know, cut into the chase if 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 the application is missing details, but they can be 
um, secured by condition, then that's what we should be doing. I appreciate the concerns about the applicant, the sorry, the public maybe not having issues of uh, drainage, uh, in, in, for example, in this case, but they can be adequately controlled by a condition, and it will be for us as officers in association with Devon County and the, the you know, the expert consultee to assess that those uh, those details are acceptable. So. I understand Councillor Jackson's concerns, but um, the unfortunately the planning system and legislation isn't isn't written in that way at the moment. And there's there's nothing wrong with the applicant uh, agreeing to have some conditions, uh, uh, sorry, some details deferred by condition. Um, what this application has done is showed the members of the public and the town council, you know, how the site's going to be laid out, where the buildings go, what they're going to look like, what parking spaces there are, and and that's 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 adequate for us to determine the application. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Rose. Um, right, over to you, Councillor Skinner. Is Mr. Councillor Moulding speaking? Or He's not it... in. All oh, right, okay, okay. It's up he to had me. to oh. leave. Okay, thank you. Okay, up to me then. That's fine. Um, yes, no, I, I, yeah, I, I sort of, I sort of get a little bit of where Councillor Jackson was coming from. I, I think, I think her principal thoughts are, uh, if I'm, if I'm uh, um, premising it correctly, um, is that she's actually in support of this and doesn't have a problem per se. I think, I think, uh, and lots of people would do because it's reuse of a of a brownfield site and it's right in the centre of the built up area boundary. I mean, there's everything. I mean, I'm going to be supporting this, and I'll, I'll lay that down now. I'm supporting the recommendation that's going with it, and I can sort of understand that when you have a. Um, a reserve matters that you sort of feel like half is taken away from you. But there's the other side of the coin, and that is from the side of the developers. It is very difficult to get planning applications in without absolute huge costs involved in doing that. And when huge costs are involved, to get to a point of reserve matters um, position is one whereby it gives a little bit of confidence for developers to invest their money. Because at the end of the day, it is about investments as well. We do need the private sector, whether we like them or don't like them, we do need the private sector to be investing in developments and doing our build outs of the applications that come forward. So, but I do understand where Councillor uh, Jackson was coming from, but as Councillor Rose has answered that, and I don't need to say it, that legislation allows and, and the law provides uh, in planning law in such a way that, that what they've done is have, that everything is absolutely right and correct. I'm going to say no more. I'm going to support this application with the conditions that's on board and negotiations that have taken place with the officers and the, and the applicants uh, have firmly put us uh, put into a good scheme that I think is going to work for excellence and I think it's uh, going to be very well put. Thank you very much indeed. I'll Thank second you. that. Who's that? Councillor Davy Key. OK, and just for clarification for any members of the public who might have been listening to that, um, Mr. Rose is not yet a councillor. <laughs> I yeah. do apologise. I do apologise. That would be a derogative <laughs> stage for councillor. I'm for Mr. Rose to be a councillor. I apologise. Chris. <clears throat> I don't think I'd wish that on him anyway. Uh, councillor Key, would you like to speak? Yes, yes, very, very quickly. In actual fact, I think this is going to be for affordable houses because they're not going to be huge and uh, that. And I think it's a, a brilliant. Um, I remember when this site came previously uh, for um, uh, to the planning. But no, I fully support this application and um, look forward to it. Uh, yeah, helping some, you know, sort of some uh, affordable people that can uh, purchase them. Thank you. Thank you. Right. Thank you. Um, Councillor Woodward. Uh, just, um, I was going to second, but uh, just to support. Okay. Thank you. Two speakers have said. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Desarum. Uh, thank you, Chair. I was going to say that we've been asked to look at access, layout, scale and appearance, and it would appear to meet all these objectives. Therefore, as everyone else has said, I'm happy to go with supporting it. Thank you. Over to you, Mr. Shaw. Thank you, Chair. There was a correction to condition one. Is the mover and seconder happy with that to incorporate that correction? Absolutely. Yep. Yes. Thank you, Thank you very much. Therefore, members, you have a motion to um, approve subject to the conditions as set out in the committee report. When your name is called, please, would you indicate whether you support the, the motion to recommend approval? 
whether you're against the motion to recommend approval or whether you're abstaining from the vote. Councillor Bloxham. Support approval. Councillor Brown. Support approval. Councillor Chamberlain. Support approval. Councillor Davy. Support approval. Councillor De Serum. Support approval. Councillor Cazard. Support. Councillor Howe. Support. Councillor Key. Support. Councillor Pratt. Support approval. Councillor Skinner. Uh, support approval. Councillor Woodward. Support approval. Councillor Rag. Support approval. That application is recommended for approval. Right, we'll take one more and then we'll have a break. Okay. Uh, so agenda item 10, application 21, 1436, Full Minor Park Farm, Farringdon, pages 46 to 61. I'd like to welcome Mike Palmer, the applicant. Welcome Hello. to the meeting, Mr. Palmer. Thank you. you will have three minutes to speak after Mr. Rose has presented his report. Over to you, Mr. Rose. Thank you, Chair. So, yeah, this is based to Park Farm at Farringdon and it's uh, application for construction of a three bed bungalow. It's before you because there's uh, ward member support. Uh, you'll see that there's also uh, comments from the parish council who support and say that the proposal complies with uh, their neighbourhood plan policy uh, FAR 5. So this is the this this the location of the site. Uh, the, the main residence is, is over here. You can see it uh, down as Park Farm on the map and you can see the long driveway through down uh, the outskirts of, of Farringdon. Uh, and then when we zoom in, so you can see uh, the properties over here and then the location for the for the proposed bungalow off the access lane. Uh, and here's the aerial of that. So in this uh, in this open countryside here is where the, the, the dwelling is proposed. Three bed uh, bungalow, there's the internal layout and the design. So rendered some uh, edge boarding and a slate roof. Uh, there we go. And this is the location site uh, here. Off to, or I was off to the right of the previous photo and this piece of land off the access road there. Um, so. Uh, it's to the east of two dwellings, as you saw on the proposal. There's no public views of the site. It's about 500 metres. It's quite a long driveway into the site. So no wider views, no wider visual harm from the proposal. Uh, uh, but it's outside of any built-up area boundary. Uh, Farringdon doesn't have a built-up area boundary. So therefore, everything here is within the countryside. Um, and as it's outside a built-up area boundary, there's no local plan support for a new open market dwelling in this location, and it's not close to a range of services and facilities. Um, but there is uh, the Farringdon Neighbourhood Plan, and Strategy 7 of the local plan uh, allows development that's in accordance with a neighbourhood plan. Uh, and there is a policy FAR 5 of the neighbourhood plan, which is called Self and Custom Build. And that policy in the neighbourhood plan uh, says that following a needs survey, uh, they recommend the need, uh, they've identified the need for 12 new homes uh, that are needed in the area. Um, and that policy runs through a number of criteria, which I will run through. So uh, in terms of the first conditions, it's uh, requirements, it says that the building should be self-built. Uh, well, we can condition that that's the case. It said it should be single storey, which it is in this case. Uh, shouldn't be more than three bedrooms. Uh, again, it applies with that and can be built to accessible standards, which it can. But there are two criteria to the policy that, that it doesn't comply with. The first one is the size. There's a criteria that says that the maximum size uh, should be 100 square metres. Uh, we've measured that at 101.69. So, I mean, only fractionally over that. But the neighbourhood plan has got that 100 square metre uh, rule. Uh, but more importantly... Thank you. Uh, more importantly, um, the local plan, uh, the neighbourhood plan says that the site should be in the curtilage of existing dwelling. Uh, so, it, so whilst the site is owned by the applicant, it's not in their curtilage. The curtilage is divide, defined by the consent, uh, the original consent for the house and its garden to that bungalow, and this falls outside of that. So it isn't within the curtilage as required by that policy. And the policy in the neighbourhood plan uh, states that what they are supporting here is the subdivision of residential plots. So to allow people to subdivide their existing plots 
to allow people to uh, downsize. Uh, and our view, as you can see from the report and from these photos, is this site clearly does not form part of the Kurt approved Kirtledge to that uh, to that dwelling. So it's clear to officers that that proposal does not comply with uh, FAR 5 of the neighbourhood plan because it isn't proposed within the Kirtledge of the dwelling. And it's therefore proposing a new dwelling in the open countryside. Uh, but there are no other concerns you'll see from the report with the access in relation to the design and the layout uh, or the suitable access. So this comes down to an assessment of the proposal against uh, the neighbourhood plan policy par far, far five and uh, in relation, mainly in relation to the site not being within the curtilage and therefore not complying with that neighbourhood plan policy. And in lack of that, in light of the lack of that plan, lack of planning policy support and the isolated location of the dwelling in the countryside, the application is recommended for refusal. Thank you. Thank you. Right. Um, Mr Palmer, you have three minutes. Uh, thank you. Before I start, can I just correct... Uh, we did put an amended uh, um, plan in to show that the building was under the 100 square metres. Um, so uh, my three minutes then. OK, good day, everyone. Thank you for listening to me. Uh, my name's Mike Palmer. and I'm here today to ask you to support my application for this modest sized bungalow at Park Farm. Park Farm's a small holding set in 40 acres. We have three generations living here. Uh, my eldest daughter, Lucy, her husband and three children live in the converted barn next door to the main house. Uh, my second daughter, Alice, her husband and son live here with me. Uh, my youngest daughter, Freya, is 16 and lives here part time. So the plan is for me to move into the new bungalow when I retire and leave the main house for my second daughter and her growing family to live in. I first made this application back in June of last year under the new adopted Farrander Neighbourhood Plan. As it happens, this is the first application East Devon, in East Devon under the new Neighbourhood Plan rules. Um, because of this newness, the Neighbourhood Plan has caused difficulties for the planning team in terms of how to interpret its various rules. This is mainly why the application is taking so long to decide. The proposed bungalow complies with all the criteria set out under FAR 5 of the Farrandon Neighbourhood Plan. This is the part of the plan that deals with the future development of Farrandon. The only sticking point I have with the planning team is the question of curtilage. In this case, the planning team insists my curtilage is a boundary drawn tight around the existing farmhouse. I find this to be too restrictive as another dwelling couldn't fit within that suggested boundary. It seems somewhat absurd that I sit in the middle of 40 acres and can't have a modest dwelling here. My proposed position is secluded, is next to the existing driveway and services, is on ground that forms part of the existing garden area and is close to the other two buildings, yet still of a distance that allows for mutual privacy. 85% of the residents of Farringdon voted in favour of this plan. And in talking to my neighbours, it seems the most attractive part of it was the modest development it afforded to existing families to house their growing families. Uh, this was in order to stop the younger folk from leaving and going elsewhere. Parish Council have fully supported this application, as too have the ward member, and also my immediate neighbours, which wasn't mentioned earlier. The proposed is a bungalow less than 100 square metres, is in private secluded location and fits with the spirit of the wishes of the residents of Farrandon. And I hope you can support it. Thank you. Thank you. Um, right, Councillor Chamberlain, ward member, you've got as long as you like. Where to start? Thank you very much, Chair. No, um, I didn't realise I was actually speaking on this until today, today and I saw my name. But um, there we go. Anyway, I shall um, I shall speak about it. Um, it is, like we said, we've looked at it and the Parish Council support it and um, the neighbours support it. The other ward member supports it. This far five... Um, I've been through it and looked at it and we've got six options there and I can see that, that they tick five of those boxes. Um, in the cartilage, as Mr Palmer has just said, I, I, I would need clarification on that. Is, is that as tight to the house as it's been explained, Mr Rose, whether you could just um, 
help me with that one. Open market. To me, it's not going on the open market, this property. This property is for multi-generational family. So it's to ensure that the family are kept together on, on the land that they already own. Uh, Mr. Palmer's just said that there's 40 acres there. They're not looking to put a property, a big, large property, you know, like we've just seen, well, even like, you know, big shed conversion or anything like that. They're looking to put a modest bungalow for Mr. Palmer to retire in. Um, I believe that with Farringdon Neighbourhood Plan, actually, it, it's, it, it has ticked pretty much most of Bar 5's um, uh, points, if you like. Um, it, Farringdon had a fantastic response to their neighbourhood plan. Um, 85%. And, and when I was told that, I thought, wow, that's really good. That is that is a really good community that wanted to get involved and cared about the area that they live in. Um, I believe Broadcliffe was actually something like 25%, just in comparison. Um, so to me, that shows that the community in that area were happy for this sort of thing to go forward as long as it met these criteria, if you like. And, and I do believe if this was on the main road, I, I would look at it in a slightly different light, but this is well off of, off of the road, surrounded by its own grounds, not going to open market, it's staying with the family for those reasons. Um, and I can't see, I, I'm struggling with the refusal of it. And actually I, I would be very much supportive of this application and um, in conjunction with the parish council. Uh, but I would like to hear the debate from other members of the committee. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> um, could I go back to Mr. Rose to address the point that um, Councillor Chamberlain made? Also, if he could confirm that what Mr. Palmer said about the reduction in size, um, could he confirm that please? Thank you, Chair. Yeah, so I think I think all I can do is direct you to the report and the first photo in the report that's got a red line around it that shows the extent of where officers believe the red line or the sorry the curtilage is in terms of the the property and its garden, and that also shows in blue the relationship to uh, to the site. Um, we, 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 you know, we, we, we can only go by what the neighbourhood plan policy says, and and the policy says it should be in the curtilage. And it actually says that the proposals must comply with these criteria. So it's quite strict from that point of view about what it's wanting. Um, I take the applicant's point about uh, the family and 85% of people being in favour of the plan. But I think 85% of people were in favour of the dwellings being within the curtilage. Um, I also take the point about it being uh, used by a family, which I, I hope it would be, but I think the fact that it isn't in the curtilage and separated, uh, separated from the site and across the access gives more opportunity for the site to be sold off uh, uh, separately. With regard to the size, uh, the latest plans I've seen still over that 100 square metre threshold. But, you know, if, if members are agreeable to the principle of development, I don't think we wouldn't want to. I don't think we would be in a position of wanting to recommend refusal on the basis of the one square metre. Um, but it's so it's more the concern is the on its own. It's more the concern of whether of the fact that the site isn't considered to be in the curtilage, which has led to the officer's uh, reason for refusal. Thank you. Thank you. And just to be absolutely clear, Councillor Chamberlain, although you're supportive, did you, you're not proposing approval? Yes, I would like to propose approval on this one. Okay. Because I, I, I'm sorry to go against officers' recommendations. Yeah. But after looking at ones that have come through the planning system recently and then looking at this one, I'd struggle with refusing it. Yeah, thank you. So there's a proposal to approve. Is there a seconder, please? There is no I'll, second. I'll, uh, I'll second, Chair. Right. Uh, would you like to speak on it, Councillor uh, Davey? Yes, just briefly. Um, I, I mean, I, I accept everything that Mr. Rose has said. I, I think the curtilage thing is, is a bit technical. Um, I appreciate that it is 
possibly just outside the curtilage of the, of the building and 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 the fact that it you know the applicant owns 42 acres well that's fine but we don't uh, want farms building um, <clears throat> uh, houses all over the place just because they own the land so the curtilage thing is important but it is very close to to an existing building it's not um stuck in, in what i would regard as open countryside um so i think in this instance although i i accept everything that's been said i think it does pretty much comply um with the uh with far five um uh, given that it's it's very close to the existing building and um not really uh, stuck right out in the middle of a field Thank you. Councillor Howe. Thank you. Um, I think I need to start with this used to be my ward. Um, <laughs> and obviously in those days, I recommended the parish council to start a neighbourhood plan <coughs> and was obviously ward member for when this neighbourhood plan was started and helped briefly uh, while the boundaries were redrawn as well. As well. So um, I'm, I'm struggling with this because I think it should be approved. But I also at the same time get if we don't follow the policies and we're talking about neighbourhood plan policies here, then where do you draw a line? Now, there is a clear line that has been put in policy terms, which is for the probably rare times, I think we need to go to site. Because if this is, as the applicant has said in his garden, we need to see it because there is a difference between a garden and a drawn curtilage on a map that exists from God knows when. Now, I've been looking on Google Maps uh, or Google Earth, and it doesn't look like a garden on Google Earth, but I think on the ground it might look slightly different. I don't know. It's hard to tell. Um, but I would get, get a better view. Yeah. Uh, what's that there? Is that looks like a farm machinery. That's what I'm struggling with. If it was a garden, I would be happy. It looks a bit like redundant land, but then farmers treat their redundant land as a garden anyway sometimes. Um, and as I say, I'm, I am struggling only on that point. Everything else, I'm more than happy, and I wish this would be approved. But uh, I am very cautious about the uh, neighbour plan and adhering to it for obvious reasons of future other properties. So I shall listen in intently. Thank you. Councillor Skinner. Uh, and I and I echo some of the things that uh, Councillor Howe has, has suggested, but but I, I will say that um, you know the, this this is not uh, we've battled them we with um, with the keeping you know farming families and that together and all the rest of it, and all the farms all those sorts of things. So the problem this has is it doesn't have that. It doesn't have something that, that gives us a, 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 an ability and and if you know just within within the documentation itself, you know, provide a support for dwelling in the countryside policy H four. In this instance, though, the applicant has not provided evidence to support an application on the basis of that policy. Therefore, the local plan does not offer any support for the proposal. And, you know, I think we, we, we try really hard on this committee to come to common sense, practical solutions to problems um, through the planning process, if we can. So we start with these things that we want to support this application. That's where I come from. I'd really love to support this application. Give me the reasons why. And I struggled with the one previous one where Council Arnott spoke about it. It was, it was almost with gritted teeth that I went against that one. But um, I, I just need some reasons as to why. And for me, there aren't any. And I think the officers, in all honesty, I've almost sort of uh, half sort of tried, but the, the policies uh, are set down by ourselves as councillors. We set these policies down and, and then, uh, uh, we, you know, they, they don't always fit in time. And I understand that they get outdated and all the rest of it. But we are where we are this one. And I, and I think uh, I won't be supporting the recommendation of approval. Um, I can't put the recommendation of going with the, the uh, recommendation that's in front of us, which would be a refusal. Um, but I do do it through gritted teeth and I absolutely understand why. And like I say, if there was an agricultural reason or some other reason that we could hang our hats on, but there doesn't seem to be. And it is, no matter how you cut it up, it is just a, a development in the countryside. And I think this is quite um, a, a real difficult one, could be quite 
dangerous. We want to be mindful of that. The easy one would be that if we refused it, of course, uh, and it went to appeal, we'd see what the appeal officer would say. Well, I'll be putting my money on that. I think that would come out in exactly the same way. So that's where these things sometimes land. There's no fallback uh, for us or the applicants. So I apologise to the applicant for that, but we are where we are and uh, I, I won't be supporting the application. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Desarum. Thank you, Chair. I think, as, as previous speakers have said, um, and Mr. Rose has pointed out, it is in a position where there is no wider visual harm. It's, it's in the right space, but we've got this issue to overcome of, of the, if we can, of the neighbourhood plan policy. Um, clearly, the wording of the policy is the words must comply. So that isn't sort of at your, you know, at your own discretion. So clearly the, the policy has actually on this occasion tied our, our hands. And I know having worked on my own Exmouth neighborhood plan, how demanding making up a neighborhood plan is. So for that reason, I feel very strongly supportive of the neighborhood plan policy. But I think Councillor Howe did come up with a very uh, splendid idea, if, if we can, maybe do a site visit to actually determine whether or not we, we would agree with where the curtainage is drawn. Because obviously, as everyone has said, that's the main obstacle in this, in this application. So anyway, that's, that's my thoughts on it. And, and thank you so much, Chair. Thank you. Well, <clears throat> although the um, neighbourhood plan uh, has those policies, um, the parish council is going against its own neighbourhood plan supporting this. So a bit of a dilemma. Uh, Councillor Chamberlain again. Thank you very much, Chair. You almost took the words right out of my mouth. And I would agree with Councillor Howe as well. Um, and, and it's great to hear from him because I know he knows this area well and he's been highly involved in it. For me, looking at this, that was the part, was that the parish council made their own neighbourhood plan. Yet the parish council on this have supported the application. To me, the people who know their policy is the best, they created them, would be the parish council. So for this application not to meet FAR 5, I would expect the parish council to be coming back with that comment and saying, it does meet most of our, our, our neighbourhood plan, but it doesn't meet this part. Whereas the parish council have said that they would support this application, which indicated to me hence why I put forward the recommendation for approval, that actually the parish council who created that neighbourhood plan with the local residents support it, which means that they would think this is okay. So that's sort of where I am to explain, um, if you like. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Key. Thank you, Chair. Yes, I mean, I, I'm, I'm the same opinion as, as Councillor Skinner. I mean, we like to keep farming families together. But uh, on 40 acres, uh, it's not sufficient enough on the, the type of farming uh, to actually support three families. And I honestly don't think that the families are actually working the farm, or we haven't been told that they're working the farm. And uh, therefore, um, I think that... Um, you know, if uh, Mr. Palmer wants to um, uh, retire, then there could possibly be properties in the village of Farringdon that he could um, purchase, rather than actually building something here that is not going to comply with policy. So I'm sorry, but I cannot support this application. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Woodward. Thank you, Chair. Uh, well, it is a difficult one, isn't it? If the... Um... <laughs> The uh, council have produced their own parish council, their own plan, but in fact, an 85% are for it. Um, but uh, in fact, they have sort of caused their own problem because it says it must comply with all criteria. And I cannot see that this is the curtilage. It's a long distance from the main house. And it seems clearly to me from the photos, this is in a field. Um, so maybe they want to build something closer, which would be if either much closer to the curtilage or within it. Um, so it seems odd that we should be going against a policy which um, says all criteria must be met. And when this one doesn't, I think the 1% is, is irrelevant. That's not an issue. But it, the, the fact that where this bungalow is positioned is relevant. 
Um, so I think the neighbor plan probably needs to be amended if they want to get this sort of thing through. Mm. So um, I have to go with the officer's recommendation at the moment. Thank you. Thank you. Over to you, Mr. Shaw. Thank you, Chair. Um, members, as you're going against officer recommendation, could the proposer and seconder just clarify the reasons for going against officer recommendations? Hmm. Councillor Chamberlain? Sorry, I was trying to unmute. <laughs> um, can I? No. <laughs> Because I am, I am so on the fence. But after literally listening, like like I have, and looking at the parish council's response to their own their <laughs> their own neighbourhood plan, that's why it tipped me just over the other way um, to approval. I've listened to everybody, and I, I'm, I am literally sat on the fence either way. Um, so can I come up with a really good reason for it? No, not on the moment. Only what tipped me was the parish council's response. Thank you. And the seconder, please. Thank you, Chair. Um, yes, I, I mean, I think um, I would want to say it's because there is support from the parish council um, who are looking at their own neighbourhood plan. Um, and also the fact that the curtilage issue uh, seems to me to be um, rather technical and a, a matter for dispute about exactly where the curtilage is. Um, and I do wonder whether this might possibly be allowed on appeal, um, but I'm, I'm happy to continue supporting it. Thank you. And finally, Councillor Skinner. Uh, on that basis, um, Chair, the, if Councillor Chamberlain is... I assume she's withdrawing. I take it this motion is going to fall. She hasn't, said, she hasn't said so, Councillor Skinner. Oh, oh I, was, I was going to say, I'm going to go with the officer recommendation and go with that, but we need to clarify that with Councillor Chamber. I'll leave that to you, Chair. Thank you. Um, could, could I just ask Mr Rose if he's happy he can formulate a reason for refusal out of those last comments from the mover and seconder? Because mean, we are also looking at our own local plan policy as well as FAR 5. Through you, Chair. Um, well, well, that's the difficulty, isn't it? Is that uh, we can't, we, uh, it's not a sound reason for approval to say it's because, you know, that's what the parish council want. It has to be on planning grounds. Um, and really to approve it, we'd have to be saying that we feel that it falls within the curtilage of the dwelling if it is uh, and if it isn't in the curtilage then there's no other local plan support so we would need a, a another compelling reason to support it so mm -hmm. um if, if if members are going to go down the route of approving it then i think they have to somehow argue that it's part of the part of the curtilage because i can't see any other policy reason for approving it thank you mr rose right mr shaw our members putting forward that as the reasons that they are, I'm sorry, Chair, to, to belabor this point, but the reason for going against officer recommendation is an important point when um, drafting up these decisions. Over to you, Councillor Chamberlain. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I, it would have to go forward then as, as the cartilage, cartilage even. Um, what well, I don't, but if it's going forward as that, it's on the other side of the drive, if you like. So, Chair. Who's that? It's Councillor Howe. Howe. Could yeah. I take a recommendation to the proposer? Um, mm. Because quite literally, I don't believe she can achieve what she wants to achieve in the way she wants to achieve it, because you just can't. The only mm. way you could achieve what she wants to achieve is by a site visit. I don't believe this committee will go along with a site visit, but I suggest if that's what she wants to support is support the approval, then I would recommend her to make a, the proposal of a site visit. I second that. I'm happy to second it or third it. <laughs> yeah, then I add that into my proposal just so we can be sure. Therefore, Councillor Chamberlain. 
Councillor Chamberlain, can I recommend you withdraw your recommendation of approval and make that yeah. into a recommendation for a site visit to ascertain the extent of the curtilage? Yeah, I will do exactly that. I will withdraw my first proposal and put forward a proposal for a site visit to ascertain the site curtilage. Yes, yeah, I'll support There's a second that as well. With that. Yes, yeah. thank you. Thank you, members. Chair, are you happy for me to go ahead with the um, the vote on that basis? Yeah, not happy, but yeah, go ahead. <laughs> Thank you. Members, you've heard the uh, proposal for a site visit by the committee to ascertain the uh, site curtilage before the matter coming back to committee for determination. Please, would you indicate whether you're in support of that motion to go on a site visit, whether you're against that motion to go on a site visit, or whether you're abstaining from the vote when your name is called? Councillor Bloxham. Against a site visit. Councillor Brown. Against. Councillor Chamberlain. For. Councillor Davy. Support. Councillor Desaron. Su support site visit. Councillor Gazard. Support. Councillor Howe. Councillor Howe. Support. I'll come back. To, oh, thank you. Councillor Key. Against. Councillor Lawrence. Against. Councillor Pratt. For. Councillor Skinner. Against. Councillor Woodward. Support. Councillor Rag. Support. Just do some sums. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight in support of a site visit and one, two, three, four, five against. So uh, that is recommended for a site visit. Thank you, Wendy. Right, members. Are we, will we be allowed a site visit with COVID? Yes, we have, um, we have done this. We did it for the Lower Otter Restoration Project. If I could just suggest that um, officers draw up some guidance for a, a site visit by everybody so that we can ensure that um, as it is an external site visit, we can just yeah. ensure that everybody is COVID safe. Yeah. Right, thank you. Thank you members. Um, can we now have a break and come back? Half past one, is that long enough for everyone or would you like a little longer? I hear no dissenting voices, so... I, personally, I'd like a bit longer. Okay, 20 to two, yeah? Yes, agreed. Thank you. Fine, thank you. Okay, members, if you can just make sure you're muted because the live stream will be running, so any comments will be heard. Thank you. Amanda, are you in the meeting?
one. Two, three. You there, Wendy? Yes, I have. I've um, taken down the slide, so when you're ready, Chair. Yeah, ready then, Wendy. Can you do a roll call, please? Yes, certainly. Thank you. So I'll start with you again, Councillor Rack. Yeah. Present. Thank, thank you. Councillor Chamberlain. Present. Thank you. Councillor Bloxham. Present. Thank you. Councillor Brown. <clears throat> Sorry, present. Thank you. Have we got Councillor Coleman back? I can see him in the meeting, so I'll come back to him. Councillor Davy. Present, thank you. Thank you. Councillor Tessera. Present, good afternoon, Wendy. Good afternoon, thank you. Councillor Gazard. Present, thank you, Wendy. Thank you. Councillor Howe. Present. Thank you. Councillor Key. Present, Wendy. Thank you. Councillor Lawrence. Present, Wendy. Thank you. Councillor Pratt. Present. Thank you. Councillor Skinner. Present. Just put me sugar in me tea. Yeah, present. <laughs> thank you. Councillor Woodward. I'm present. Thank you. Thank you. So I'm just going back to Councillor Coleman. Okay, he is not there. Okay, sorry, Chair. Um, back to you. We are caught up for this afternoon's meeting. Thank you very much, Wendy. 
Uh, right, agenda item 12. Um, yes, agenda item 12, yes. Uh, application 21, 1781, full minor application, Higher Kerskamp Farm, Benetton, pages 73 to 83. Um, like to welcome Malcolm Gig to the meeting. Welcome, Malcolm. Um, Hello. And who else have we got? Nobody else down. Mm. Nobody else down to speak. So uh, over to you, Mr. Rose. Sorry, Chair. I think Councillor Bruce was going to speak, but I don't know whether What's he speak? is present. Oh yes. Sorry, that was a yes. I don't know. He's going to speak. Sorry to interrupt, but he's going to speak on the other application, not this one, because this is uh -huh. the glamping pods one, and he wanted to speak on the other one. Okay, thank you. Um, right, over to you, Mr Rose. Thank you, Chair. Yeah, so this is application at, at High Coast Coast Farm in Fenerton, and it's for three glamping pods or, or shepherd huts and an access drive, and each of the, the huts or pods is 6.6 .6 metres by 3.3 .3 metres, and it's here because it has the support of the ward member and you can see the red line on the site there. Uh, it's two kilometres north of Fenerton and we've got a farm complex down here and we're in the AOMB and we are on part of agricultural fields. Uh, and if I just go through, so we've got the farm buildings here and the dwelling and we get the uh, access lane going in and then you can see the location for the pods and an image of uh, how the pods will, will appear. And this is the aerial. So we've got the farm complex here and the application site is on this part of the field here. And you can see the screen into the, the lane that runs along the along the site. And then and then that's that in photo form. So you can see the the uh, open nature of the site, but then the screen in provided by uh, boundary trees and views back across uh, towards the site. Uh, and, and these are views from within the site uh, of the farm complex. Uh, let me stick to that. Uh, where are we? There we go. Um, so in terms of the principle, we're in the open countryside uh, and obviously policy S7 says to be acceptable, we need an other policy support in the local plan. Uh, you'll see that the application, <clears throat> uh, the Office of Report mentions policy 19 that relates to holiday parks. It's not necessarily a holiday park, but there is more than one unit. So I think the criteria are helpful in assessing the proposal. Uh, and I'll go through those. So with regard to visual impact, uh, this is at the bottom of the field. There's hedging and screening to the site. There's limited public view. So as such, it's not considered to be any, uh, any, any harmful visual impact uh, from the proposal. Uh, then the next criteria is, is uh, it's in close proximity uh, to a settlement and services and facilities. But we're two kilometres from Fenerton. We are reliant on the car here. There's narrow lanes, no pavements, it's unlit. Uh, so in terms of East, uh, E19, we're in an unsustainable countryside location. The next criteria to E19 says it shouldn't be on best and most versatile agricultural land, but this site, uh, the, the, the site where this is proposed is on grade three agricultural land. So the policy precludes that uh, and the loss of the agricultural land, however, however small in this instance does weigh against the proposal. Uh, the next criteria is adequate services on site. Well, it, it will provide adequate services for, the, for these huts. And uh, the final criteria is about traffic impact uh, and the traffic levels would be low and, access, and, and the access is suitable. So, but given the, uh, it's on best and most versatile agricultural land and given its unsustainable location, the proposal doesn't comply with policy E9. Uh, we then looked at policy E4 on agricultural diversification, uh, and obviously this allows schemes that are complementary to rural businesses and farmers to be allowed. Um, but the site do the, the, that doesn't apply, <coughs> excuse me, where applicants live in a rural area but aren't employed uh, or aren't running the farms and that that rural business, and compliance is that uh, compliance with that is key. Uh, and that's what's formed a lot of discussion with the applicant on this application and uh, outlined in the report. As we understand it, the applicant uh, assists uh, relatives in the running of the uh, adjoining farm. They don't actually run it themselves and they don't earn, um, they don't earn uh, an income from it. Their main source of income is elsewhere away from the farm, I think in more, more traditional uh, work. And the applicant wants to earn their main income from the site uh, rather than uh, elsewhere. 
Uh, but there's no, but that that raises a concern that if it isn't related to a farming or a rural business, how is that here as a, as a precursor to help help farming or help the adjoining farm? These pods could just be let independently without that benefit to any rural uh, diversification, any rural business. Um, so there's no uh, farm or rural diversification proposed here. Uh, and as such, it's not considered to comply with policy E4 that has that requirement. And in addition, policy E4 says that we shouldn't be allowing such proposals on best and most versatile agricultural land. And this is grade three agricultural land. So in light of that, you'll see in the report that we don't feel there's support for the proposal for E4 as it's not agricultural diversification uh, or support for E19 as it's not well located. And in both instances, there's grade three agricultural land to be lost. So in light of that lack of planning policy support, the application is recommended for refusal. Thank you. Thank, thank you. Um, uh, Mr. Gig, would you like to speak now? Yes, thank Three you. Minutes. Thank you. Um, Chairman, thank you for allowing me to talk before you today. Um, I disagree with um, Mr. Rose's comments. Um, the application before you today is for um, diversification of farming. Um, to create a secondary income to support the existing farmers who own and operate the farm. The officers' report and conclusions have gone to length to explain that the farm, in their opinion, is a secondary income, and that for that reason, policy E4, rural diversity, is not supported. What the officers' report does not cover sufficiently is the detail and information that has been provided to the council by the clients in their own diversification statement, is clearly showing that the current farm has for the last three generations been run by the client's family and for the last 15 years by the client himself. This stating that the farm is the primary place of work, that the only reason the clients have had to find secondary incomes are due to um, the Brexit and the global um, COVID-19 pandemic, as this has resulted in a vast loss of income for our clients. The clients took on a secondary job to sustain the farm and through the creation of three glamping pods would enable them to work 100% back on the farm with the secondary income to bring the farm back to its full use. The application is not as stated in the officer's report um, for just any landowner to provide holiday accommodation on their land. This application is for the third generation farming family to ensure that they can pass the farm onto the fourth generation and to ensure that they can create a sound financial standing for the farm. The correct evidence has been provided to the planners for both financial and ownership of the farm, as well as statements of why the secondary jobs have been taken by the owners. This has, as I've stated before, for the survival of the farm as a temporary measure. The proposed location of the pods has been carefully chosen as not to impact the use of the farmland. This is located adjacent to the tree line and is hidden from public view due to the um, undulation of the land form. Parking for the pods will be on land already hard surfaced and adjacent to farm buildings and only path access will be provided to the pods. In conclusion, we feel the diversification of the farm use to create a secondary income is in line with policy E4 and that this income will ensure that the future of the current farm through a secondary income for the current owners and operators of the farm. The application has parish council, district councillor and highway support, as well as good support from the general public online. We would therefore ask the committee to support this application for the local farm to ensure that it can be retained for the next generation. Thank you. Thank you. Um, right, let me see. We have speakers now. Chair, um, yeah. I'm sorry to interrupt. I, I noticed that Councillor Coleman has come back. Could I just oh. ask whether he has heard both of the representation, Chris Rose's um, presentation and Mr Giggs' representations to the committee? Yes. Can you respond to that, Andrew, please? Andrew Coleman. Hello. Hello. Hello, I'm here, yes. Yeah, did you hear both um, Mr. Rose's um, report 
and Mr. Giggs' representation. I did, yes. All of it? Yes. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you, Shirley. Um, right. Um, Councillor Skinner, then, please. Uh, what? Sorry, was there um, a readout for Councillor Bruce or, or not? Was that not the case? Was Wendy going to read something? Councillor Bruce was going to write I something? I think that's for the next one, wasn't it, Wendy? Oh, sorry, sorry. Yes, that's correct. Yeah. Oh, sorry, you. sorry, I apologise. Just okay. making sure I covered all the dot to the yeah. I's and cross the okay. T's. Um, <clears throat> okay, yeah, well, in, in this in this particular application, I, I've, I've looked at this application and I, I know where Hire Karskin Farm is. Uh, it's only the next village to myself. It's got the support of the parish. It's got the support of the ward member. Um, and it is farm diversification. And, and I'm, I'm very much for farm diversification. And I, I, I struggle a little bit. I, I do sort of have a smile to myself under my breath because I see what's coming in, in the agricultural world about rewilding and about all the land that's going to just be let go. And, and we're just going to have the birds and the bees and the grass will grow and the trees will grow and we're going to go and talk to the trees. Well, if they're going to pay me to do that, that's absolutely fine. In this particular instance, when they talk about loss of land and all the rest of it, we assume it's for a necessary food production on grade three land. I'm all for farm diversification in whichever form that takes, um, provided it fits within with what we're doing, of course. And in the way that farming is very, very difficult and it has been difficult for many years and it's becoming increasingly more difficult. And how sad is it that a farm that we have here is and the farmers are trying to keep it going and they're going out and getting secondary jobs that just about sets the scene really by what's going to be um, happening here we had a, a clamping application did we not was it um only just in the last application which we approved in the center of um uh, um, um pay embry um so you know or coal stocks i should say so i clarify that um you know i i I'm supportive of these sorts of things. I think it's trying to bring a bit of diversity. It's trying to bring an income that is not going really against what it is, the spirit of what we're trying to do. We're trying to keep these farms alive. If we, if this sort of fails, these sorts of things, you can tell, I'll tell you what exactly what happened with, with the next sort of move. It, it beca The farm becomes very difficult. And therefore, what is all the farm buildings then will go for conversions and dwellings and goodness knows what else. And the farm then disappears as a family farm. If this is part of the survival plan for a survival farm, um, for this family to survive, then I'm all for it. So I'm going to actually go against the recommendation of refusal. Um, and I'm going to support a recommendation of approval for this particular application. I'll wait to hear what others have to say. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Woodward, you had your hand up. It's gone now. Councillor Woodward. Yeah, sorry, just getting both my photo and my picture there. Um, yeah, no, I just uh, support uh, what Councillor Skinner has just said. I don't think there's any more uh, to add. He explained it very well. Um, so I would also uh, support uh, approval of the application. I think it's the so application is welcome. Just, just to clarify, Councillor Skinner, was that a proposal? Yes, it was a proposal recommendation. Thank you. Are you seconding that, Councillor Woodward? I am, yes. Yeah. Thank you. Right, Councillor Lawrence. Yeah, I'd just like to say that, you know, again, it, it's very difficult because the officers have to work to certain criteria and they are objecting to this application based on those criteria. But common sense leads us to believe that we need to keep these farms in operation you know, it must be very difficult trying to run a business and having to go off site and work other places just to, to subsidise keeping the farm alive. So I, I'm in favour of, of, of diversification. I know there's, there's, it's taking land away from farming, but it's not that much land. And, and, and I, I think um, in, this, in this occasion, I'd like to go against the officer's um, recommendation. Thank you. Thank you. But um, it's going against our own local plans. Councillor Gazard. Thank you, Chair. I've got nothing new to add. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Desarum. Thank you very much, Chair. Yeah, I was going to say it, it is obviously disappointing that um, some grade three agricultural land will be lost, 
But um, as in many things, the benefits are outlined by the applicant on page 81, where the applicant writes, by having a small number of glamping pods, comfortably luxury accommodation, we can provide a beautiful environment for people to enjoy and have the unique experience of such a peaceful area. We can then be on site. And I think um, with the council's emphasis on mental health and well-being, um, I think it's very good that um, such such pods will um, give great happiness to those who get to use them. So for those that reason, um, I would be going against the recommendation uh, on this occasion. Thank you. Thank you very much, Chair. Thank you. Councillor Davey. Thank you, Chair. Um, I think the, there were some other uh, criteria that it also had to meet, weren't there? And one of those is that it's not in a sustainable location. So I think we're, we're getting very tied up with um, whether it enables a farm to buy diversify and, and whether that is in fact a farm or not um, but uh, I think uh, it was uh, policy E19 uh, that it was also in conflict with um, and um, so I'm, uh, I'm a bit conflicted on this one I'm not quite sure which way to go. Thank you right over to you Mrs Shaw no more hands up. Thank you chair um, could with your indulgence, could we go back to Mr. Rose to clarify that if he is happy that he has uh, sufficient reasons for members going against officer recommendations? Uh, yeah, through you, Chair. Uh, <clears throat> I think I do. I think it's a shame that um, we have had, from my perspective, looking at the application, it's a shame we've had this conflicting and unclear information submitted from the applicant. When you look at their, their submission in isolation, it, it isn't as straightforward as somebody that owns a farm and wants to diversify. Um, yeah. But saying that, uh, yes, I understand that members feel that this scheme is farm diversification and therefore that it complies with policy E4. Um, there's no locational criteria for policy E4 because obviously farms buy default are in generally in unsustainable locations uh, and I assume the members are saying that the loss of the agricultural land is minimal in this case uh, minimal harm from that uh, and that therefore the farm diversification benefits uh, outweigh that um, so yeah I'm happy uh, with that justification. Thank you, Chair. And the next point would be that, um, as this is now a motion to approve, would the mo mover and seconder ag agree to delegation of conditions to officers in consultation with the Chair, Vice Chair and Ward members to also be included in their motion? Absolutely. And the seconder? Yes. Thank you very much. Therefore, members, you've got before you the recommendation to approve. Please, when your name is called, would you indicate whether you support that motion to recommend approval, whether you're against the motion to recommend approval, or whether you're abstaining from the vote? Councillor Bloxham. Sorry, Councillor Bloxham. Support the motion to approve. Councillor Brown. Support the motion to approve. Councillor Chamberlain. Support the motion to approve. Councillor Coleman. Support the motion to approve. Thank you. Councillor Davey. Support approval. Councillor Fisferon. Support motion to approve. Councillor Gazov. Support. Councillor Howe. Support. Councillor Key. Support. Sorry, I was muted. Councillor Lawrence. Support. Councillor Pratt. Support motion to approve. Councillor Skinner. Support. Councillor Woodward. Support approval. Councillor Rag. Abstain. Thank you. So that is recommended for approval. Thank you, Wendy. <clears throat> right, we go now to agenda item 13, application 21-2474, full minor application, Goldcomb Farmhouse, Gittisham, pages 84 to 91. I'd like to welcome Ed Percy, is it Percy? The agent. Uh, welcome to the meeting. Um, and go to Chris now to present your report.
Thank you, Chair. Yeah, so Golcombe Farmhouse in Gittersham. This is an application for change of use of a holiday let to a dwelling, uh, and it has ward member support. You can see the uh, location plan uh, on the screen in front of you. So we've got a main dwelling and then uh, two holiday lets uh, at, the, at the site. Uh, and you can see where it is in relation to Gittersham. So we are uh, in the countryside, in the AOMB, and next to a Grade 2 uh, listed building. And this relates to this application relates to the cider barns. That's the, that's the property here to the side that they uh, uh, that they want to uh, remove the holiday tie and allow to become an open market dwelling. You'll see uh, from the site history there was a 2019 application, <coughs> excuse me, withdrawn, and there was a 2020 application uh, that came in to vary the condition. Uh, but that was the application, uh, one of the applications where the inspector determined that uh, you couldn't go through that route of varying the condition and you needed to have a, uh, a planning application submitted for a change of use. Um, so there's a history to this site, uh, but, no, but no external alterations proposed uh, to the building. So uh, we've got policy E18 of the local plan that, that mentions where uh, holiday units will be protected. Um, but following a high court decision, that policy only applies to our key, uh, our key towns, uh, Sidmouth, Seaton, Exmouth, Budley, etc. So it doesn't apply to this site. Um, and there's no other policy in the local plan that, particularly, uh, that specifically rates, relates to the removal of holiday ties. Although obviously there's the general policies in the local plan that support tourism because of the uh, economic benefits to the area. So uh, as with other applications on this agenda, we're, we're down to considering the application against policy D8 of the local plan, which allows conversions, allows conversions to residential use, but where they are well located close to services and facilities. In this case, we're about 700 metres to the village, but the village itself has limited services. It doesn't have a built-up area boundary and we're a considerable distance for Honiton, from Honiton. So the site is reliant on the, on the use of the car. Uh, and from that point of view, the proposal is uh, unsus unsustainable location and the proposal is contrary to policy D8. With regard to other considerations, you'll see in the report that there's some support on the basis there's a need for rental accommodation in the area, um, but there's no guarantee, but like the other application on the agenda, that this application, this site would be rented. Uh, we can't um, insist on that through the application. Um, the, the, there's also, uh, and there's no evidence uh, of that before us. Um, the applicant has always all. So put forward the fact that there's been a downward trend in profits from this site. And in 2019, there was they made a loss uh, and therefore it's unviable to keep it in holiday use. Um, we, we, we question that, bearing in mind that there's been applications 2019 to remove this holiday tie. So we assume in that period it hasn't been well marketed. And we've got the position at the moment with staycations being high, that there's been high, very high demand across the district for holiday accommodation. So I'd be surprised if, the, um, if there isn't demand for its continued use at the moment. So in summary, there's, there's no policy support for the proposal. It's contrary to policy DA. It's in an unsustainable location. Occupiers will be reliant on the car. Um, um, and um, we shouldn't be allowing the loss of holiday accommodation where it does rely on the, the, the uh, use of the car. Uh, and also there's a need and benefit from tourism and holiday lets. So uh, in light of that, the application is recommended for refusal. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> we go to the agent now. Uh, Mr. Now, I'm not sure if it's Perse or Percy, uh, so forgive me if I've pronounced it wrongly. Ms. Percy, you have three minutes. Uh, thank you, Madam Chairman. It's it's purse. Um, so ah. you, you you got it right. You got it right second time. That's uh, that's fine. Don't know. That's 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 not a problem. Um, Madam Chair, members, uh, thank you for the opportunity to speak today on this application. Um, I'd like to point out that Councillor Bruce and the Gittison Parish Council both support the application. And members will note that there are nine letters of support, including um, from the Pig and the Coom Estate. And I would urge members to take these uh, comments into account um, when making your decision. The site uh, benefits from residential use in the form of holiday let. Uh, thus, the usual converse, conversion considerations have been previously agreed. And the only issue uh, relates to the lifting of the holiday let restriction. D8 states that sites should be close to a range of accessible services and facilities. I suggest the site is close to a range of accessible services and facilities. The policy does not define what close is, nor does it specifically define that future residents need to have a choice of means of transport. It just says close. Gittersham has a daily, uh, regular daily bus service and the site is close to Gittersham and Hon Honiton, and in my view complies with policy eight. 
COVID-19 has taught us that services such as shops are available online to all and, and all major supermarkets, as well as Ocado and Amazon delivering, uh, will deliver to the application location. Thus, the specific requirements of the policy relating uh, to close to accessible services now been overtaken by customer preference to food and goods being delivered. Uh, in this case, the site is considered to be acceptable. I would draw members uh, to two similar applications. One allowed an appeal and the second was approved by the planning committee. Policy D8 was the main policy consideration in both of these applications. The appeal site related to a site at Farway, which is a similar distance from Honiton to the current site, and was for the removal of the hol uh, holiday condition. The inspector allowed the appeal and in relation to policy D8, he stated, Whilst I find that the site is not accessible by a range of public uh, range of transport modes, this policy does not distinguish between between open residential uses and those restricted for holiday accommodation. Given that the building is already converted for residential use, I find that this policy has no is not directly relevant to the appeal. He goes on to state in relation to policy TC2. However, this is. In this case, a residential use already exists and there is no evidence of any increase in travel would be significant. Therefore, I do not find conflict with the aims of policy TC2. I, it is considered that the same conclusions can apply to the case currently before members. The second application was 172466 full, which was for a change of use to a, of a barn to a dwelling between Luppet and Dunkerswell, and that was approved by the planning committee against the officer recommendation. Accordingly, I would urge members to do the same in this case and grant the application. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Now, Councillor Bruce, is he here yet? No, but I have a statement to read. Oh, thank you. OK. Off you go, Wendy. OK. Thank you. Having heard the debate around application 21-2781-FUL near Colleton, there are many principles to be drawn with that. Indeed, many of the points raised by Councillor are, are also relevant with this application. This appears to be yet another case of planning being out of step with current events. We have recently, as shown on TV, seen the severe lack of permanent accommodation, so there is a demonstrable need for small affordable accommodation. The officer's report highlights the current provision of holiday accommodation in the Gittisham area, but the loss of a single offering to this market cannot form part of a refusal. Nor can the point regarding access raised in the last paragraph of this report, where debate is raised as to whether people will walk to the village and the lack of pavement. The current holidaymakers walk to the village a distance of some 700 metres and in most parts of the district lanes, sorry, and in most parts of the district lanes have no pavement or verge. I would finish by saying this application has the full support of the parish, ward members and other parties. End of statement. Thank you. Thank you, Wendy. Right, Councillor Skinner. Madam Chair, we, 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 we seem to be falling into the world of conflict nearly in every application that's coming along here because, uh, uh, again, I, I, I absolutely understand why uh, they would want to, this, this, this to happen in, in some respects. Um, and I will ask for a bit of clarification from Mr. Rose in a minute because one of the reasons that I think I would go with the officer's recommendation of refusal is because it doesn't seem to be any... any um, leverage here for us to move out of that. Now, what was mentioned by uh, Mr. Pars, I believe, earlier was talking about an application that went to the planning inspector and the planning inspector, so-called, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but so-called placed in the bin our policy to TC2, almost as if um, it, it didn't sort of hold uh, at all and didn't have any water. And, and almost he referred to it as being as irrelevant. I'm going to ask Mr. Rose whether this is actually in fact, um, whether this is the case indeed. Um, and on, on, on that basis in going forward, I don't think we have any, um, uh, any ability to do anything other than go along with the officer recommendation. And that's one I will probably, well, I will do. I shall, I shall move the recommendation of refusal from this point. But I would like that, if you don't mind through you, Chair, I would like the uh, Mr. Rose to make that clarification about the planning inspectorate 
um, and their view on our policy that, that there was a reference to it didn't hold a lot of water because I'm making my judgment calls on our policies and I'd like to know they stood up. Is that is that something Mr Rose could comment on, please? Can you respond to that, Mr Rose, please? Yes, yes, of course. So yes, there was there, there, there's been one appeal decision where because of the circumstances of the case, the, the inspector has said that. But I think in, in, in response to that, uh, if you'll see in the report, we throw, we've quoted three appeal decisions where the inspector uh, are supportive of the assessment that, that we've carried out. And, and, and as, as Councillor Skinner fully knows, it's, it, it, it's a matter of each case on its merits. Um, but, you know, we've got into a policy situation where, um, we, you know, D8 is the only policy in the local plan that might allow the loss of holiday accommodation to open market dwellings. And that is quite clear that you need to be sustainably located and therefore be able to to access um, services and facilities by foot and by bike. Um, and that has been accepted by inspectors uh, on appeal. Okay. Um, and of course, there are there are you know whilst it's each case on its merit, there are there are implications yeah. because you know we have to draw a line somewhere. If you're close to yeah. a built up area boundary, we, we generally support them. But otherwise, when you're in rural locations, uh, we we resist the loss on the basis of the benefit also that tourism has to to our economy. Yeah, and could I so may I just finish on that chair three if you don't mind? Mm-hmm. Uh, and I thank you for that, Mr. Rose, because it actually does give some clarity uh, to to my position. So. My position isn't going to change then from refusal. And in fact, in fact I, it, it even becomes more sturdy because in an area that Giddesham is, you would have thought that in the climate that we've gotten people wanting staycations and going away, you think they'd be absolutely unindated with the opportunity to be able to stay uh, in a holiday accommodation um, um, set up. So, um, no, I, I'm, I'm going with the officer's recommendation on this quite strongly. And uh, I'm, I'm going to go with the recommendation, Madam Chair, through you um, of, of refusal. Thank you. Is there a second, please? I'll second that. You'd like to Councillor speak? Lawrence. Yeah, Councillor Lawrence. Yes, I, I, I think this is um, one of those cases where the, the officers have, have, have shown that it, it doesn't comply with, with, with our standards and, and therefore um, I, I, I comply with, with their recommendation to refuse. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Desarum. Thank you very much, Chair. Yes, um, I know that on this occasion, um, both the Parish Council and the Ward Council are in support of it. Um, and clearly, we would need to have these continue- retained as they are for the benefit of tourism, basically. So, um, as previous speakers have said, it is unfortunate, um, as Mr. Rose has in fact said, that because we are in a more rural location on this occasion, it's very difficult to, to make a change of policy. So, for that reason, with great reluctance, I too would have to be supporting refusal. Thank you, Councillor Key. Thank, thank you, Chair. Um, yes, I mean the thing is, I mean if we if we lift this holiday thing, it's going to be another property that could actually be put on the open market, which I think is is deplorable because if it had been applied for a dwelling in the first place, it may not have even been do it. But I still feel the same as what I said before. Is it possible that uh, this could be um, made into a permanent uh, letting place rather than the holiday? Because the holiday does restrict it somewhat, whereas if it was a permanent let, um, then uh, it would be uh, a much better income. Thank you. Mr Rose, any comment? Uh, I haven't got anything to add to what I said before, which is that unfortunately we can't do that. No, we can't. No. Okay, thank you. Uh, Councillor Pratt. Councillor Pratt. Yes, I, I, um, I haven't actually put my hand up, uh, oh. Chair. Oh. Councillor Woodward. Thank you, Chair. Um, although I'm not going to go against the officer's recommendation because the policies are, are fairly robust in this situation. Just to make the point that there is an extreme balance between a holiday let and then the acute shortage of small uh, premises for people to rent or to own. Um, and so 
at some stage when maybe this one isn't so finely balanced that um, we should bear in mind that the shortage of property for say first time buyers um, is quite acute and we need to bear that in mind sometimes but I'm not going against the officer's recommendation in this instance. Thank you. Thank you. Um, right that's all the speakers over to you Mrs Shaw. Thank you, Chair. Yes, members, you have the motion to refuse for the reasons as set out in the committee report. Please, when your name is called, would you indicate whether you support the motion to recommend refusal, whether you're against the motion to recommend a refusal, or whether you're abstaining from the vote? Councillor Bloxham. Support the motion to refuse. Councillor Brown. Support refusal. Councillor Chamberlain. Support the motion to refuse. Councillor Coleman. Support refusal. Councillor Davy. Support refusal. Councillor De Serum. Support refusal. Councillor Gazard. Support. Councillor Howe. Support refusal. Councillor Key. Support refusal. Councillor Lawrence. Support refusal. Councillor Pratt. <coughs> Support refusal. Councillor Skinner. Support refusal. Councillor Woodward. Support refusal. Councillor Rag. Support refusal. Thank you. That, rec uh, that application is recommended for refusal. Thank you, Wendy. Uh, right. Uh, application. This is agenda item 16. 21, 1684, full, minor, Bottom Barn, Broadhembury, pages 152 to 161. Thank you. Um, sorry, Joe, you've, um, you, yeah, sorry, you were talking about the, the um, Sidmouth one before. Sorry. They were, the, 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 the bottom barn ones on 163 to 172. Yeah, I, the pages are a bit over the place, I've noticed. Today. Oh, sorry. Okay. Um, I'm going by what's on my script here. Okay. Okay. All right. Sorry. Yeah. Uh, okay. So uh, on this one, we have Mr. Purse again. Welcome back, Mr. Purse. Over to you, Chris, to present your report. Thank you, Chair. Yeah, so this relates to a property called Bottom Barn in Broad Henbury, and it's the change of use of agricultural land uh, to 15 self uh, storage units. Mm. It's before committee as it's uh, a departure. Um, you can just see here. So we've got a, uh, there we go. So it relates to this area here, which is a, a part of former silage clamp, and we've got a, a business next door to the site uh, that want to the, put these storage containers uh, in the silage clamp there. Uh, so there we go. We can see the the, the farm complex, the adjoining business, uh, who's the applicant to this, and the location for the storage containers screened by the, the walls to the silage clamp. We've got a grade two uh, listed building near, nearby, but not uh, impacted by the property, and there's no landscape designations here. Uh, as I say, so in the in the former silage clamp. So in terms of the principle, we're outside of a settlement boundary in the countryside. Policy E5 does allow the uh, expansion or, or, or new businesses in rural areas in sustainable locations. Uh, this isn't this isn't highly sustainable because it's it's uh, two kilometres from Broad Henry, uh, so the proposal doesn't strictly comply with that policy. But there's all there's a policy that allows the extension of employment sites. Uh, although this isn't an expansion of the uh, adjoining business, it, it, it's related to them in terms of them being the applicants. Uh, but again, that policy says that it should ideally be on uh, on previously developed land, which this isn't. So technically, it's it's a departure because it doesn't quite comply with each of those policies. Um, but then it comes down to uh, material considerations and, and harm. And you'll see in the report that we, there's no harm to the listed building. The clamps here, the siting will the, the be self-screening. Uh, there's only going to be very couple of disc glimpsed views on the access into the site. The applicants uh, reduce the number of containers down from 25 to 15 to reduce its visual impact. Uh, and there's a condition on there about lighting to ensure no, no wider uh, impact. 
there's no harm to neighbours. Uh, there, there might be uh, some increased activity of the site, but um, that activity is going to be low because these sort of self-storage sites, people tend to come store their store their goods and then they don't come back every day. So traffic and activity will be fairly low. Uh, so very little impact on the amenity. And also from that point of view, there's an hours restriction uh, proposed. Um, so despite the despite the location and the lack of clear or, or, or lack of policy support for the proposal, uh, it will support the, the adjoining business. Uh, it, it's on ag previous agricultural land, but I think you can see from these photos, it's not in agricultural use. So there's no there's no harm to that. No visual impact, harm, no harm to the neighbours, uh, no harm to the listed building, and it will provide economic benefits from uh, the jobs that will be created uh, from that. So therefore, given the, uh, given the economic benefits, the support for the business that's applying, no visual harm, no harm to the listed building, et cetera, the application is recommended for approval with conditions. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Purse. Um Again, thank you, Madam Chair, members, um, for the opportunity to speak on this application. Um, I'll keep my comments brief, um, given the positive recommendation in the comprehensive report and the um, comprehensive update you just got from Chris there about the, about the application. Um, again, I'd like to point out that the ward member in this instance, Councillor Skinner and Broadhambury Parish Council, both support the application um, and there were no objections from statutory consultees. Uh, the application was the subject of a pre-application inquiry and the scheme as pre presented to committee has taken on board the recommendations of the pre-app um, and most notably, as Chris has already mentioned, the reduction in the numbers of storage units from 25 to 15. Um, I think it's important to note um, that the council has previ previously accepted a commercial use on the wider site and that was pointed out in Chris's presentation when they granted planning application, um, uh, planning application in 2015 um, when considering that application, the council considered the proposal in the context of policy E5, and it was found to be acceptable. Therefore, uh, there's no reason to divert from the previous accepted commercial use of the wider site. In terms of policy E7, it is important to note that this relates to the expansion of employment sites rather than specific in employment uses. And uh, we would argue that this is exactly what is being proposed is a small expansion of an existing employment site and thus it is, uh, the proposal is considered to accord with the requirements of policy E7. Um, finally, I'd probably draw your attention to the conclusions in the officer report, which states in terms of the container business, this is low scale in um, low scale nature of operation in addition to the screening provided by the existing silage clamp it isn't considered, these are considered important factors to leading the officers to believe this scheme is acceptable um, in addition to the other justifications that Chris has just set out. Um, so I would urge members to um, approve the application subject to the proposed conditions and in line with your officer recommendation. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, right, Councillor Key, please. Yes. I should think I'd probably go first as a ward member. Oh, oh sorry. Sorry, Philip, you, yeah, you may, your name's not down here. No, okay. I, I didn't, you, I didn't yes, put my hand you. up. I didn't put me no. on that because I thought it was obvious. No, <laughs> sorry. no, um, carry on. Yes, sorry, sorry, Councillor Key. <laughs> um, no, listen, uh, it, you know, I, I'm not going to add too much because I do you respond to that really. Mr. Rose set it all out really, and Mr. Purse done an excellent job stealing my thunder. So I don't think there was a lot more to say. I am very supportive. The parish council, uh, I know, got very much uh, sort of behind this. I think it's a, a good scheme. Um, so yeah, we've got the parish, the ward member, um, and 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 an officer recommendation of approval with the conditions, and and I would like to move that recommendation, please. Thank you. Hey, thank you. Is there a seconder? Yes, I'll second it. And you'd like to speak? Yeah. Then you're next to speak. Well, yes. I mean, the thing is, I mean, I was going to say, I mean, what better use could be made of that uh, derelict site, really? I mean, the containers are going to be hidden. Uh, it's a very, very short access off of the road there. Um, and I mean, I think it, it's good use of that um, disused silage pit. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, there are no more speakers. Over to you, Mrs. Uh, Shaw. Thank you, Chair. Yes, members, as you've just heard, there is a recommendation to approve with the conditions as set out in the report. 
when your name is called, please would you indicate whether you're in support of the motion to recommend approval, whether you're against the recommendation to approve, or whether you're abstaining from the vote. Thank you. Councillor Bloxham. Support approval, thank you. Councillor Brown. Support approval. Councillor Chamberlain. Support approval. Councillor Coleman. Support approval. Councillor Davy. Support approval. Councillor De Serum. Support approval. Councillor Gazard. Support. Councillor Howe. Support. Councillor Key. Support approval. Councillor Lawrence. Support approval. Councillor Pratt. Support approval. Councillor Skinner. Support approval. Councillor Woodward. Support approval. Councillor Rag. Support approval. Thank you. That application is recommended for approval. Thank you. Uh, agenda item nine now. Gosh, we're jumping around all over the place. Uh, application 21-1684, full minor application, Garlands Stover, Long Lane Beer, pages 35 to 45. Um, now, Ed Freeman will be presenting this as Chris knows the applicant. So Chris has been transferred to the waiting room. Um, and there are two statements to read out from the applicant, Helen Follett, and the ward member, Councillor Pook. So Ed, could you re um, present your report, please? Uh, thank you, Chair, and afternoon, members. Um, so this application relates to property known as Garlands on Stover Long Lane in Beer. Um, the site lies uh, just outside of the built-up area boundary and the main part of the settlement, um, which is to the southwest of the, the plan you can see on the screen. So if you follow the road down, uh, down the slope and down into the main settlement. Essentially, Garlands is uh, broken down into four uh, key units of accommodation. Uh, fundamentally, Garlands itself is the central part of the property uh, indicated here. Uh, and then there are three holiday lets, um, which are known as Seaside Inn, which is this part here. Beach House, which is the end part here. And the Boat Shed, uh, which is this area here at the front of the property. Um, so if I move to the proposed <coughs> floor plans, uh, you can see that the proposal uh, intends to incorporate uh, the units known as Seaside Inn into the main gardens property. So you can see the separation being taken away on the floor plans, the link broken through there, and also at first floor level with the bedrooms linking through into the existing property known as gardens. Um, the holiday let known as Beach House remains unchanged by these proposals, uh, but it's proposed that the property known as the Boat Shed, uh, the shaded area here at the front of the property, uh, is essentially separated off as a separate dwelling and the holiday tie removed um, so that it could be let as a, an independent unit of accommodation. We understand it is proposed to also separate off part of the curtilage to, to, to serve the Boat Shed and to provide uh, parking space to the front of the property. And I'll show you this on the photographs. Um, so this is looking from the main road at the main entrance to the property. Um, and you can see uh, one of the holiday lets just on the right hand side of the screen here. Minimize that. Um, so that's uh, Seaside Inn, which is the unit that's to be incorporated into Garlands as part of these proposals. And you can see on the front of the main property, the boat shed, which is to become a, a separate dwelling. I'll just quickly go through the rest of the photographs. This is just showing the boat shed again and its main entrance. And uh, you can see the parking to the front there. Uh, this one's looking across again at Seaside Inn, which is there. And you can see the beach house in this one to the end, which would remain holiday accommodation. And if I flick through, you can again see uh, the boat shed here. 
and you can see the garden space that would go with it, which is already reasonably separate from the main garden of garlands, which is behind uh, this row of shrubs uh, in there. And again, this is of the front of the boat shed. And I'll just go to the last one. You can see the parking area at the front of the boat shed and the patio that leads around to the garden behind. So uh, apologies for that uh, convoluted explanation, but quite a complicated proposal in terms of the built form there. Um, perhaps more simple in terms of planning policy, the main policy constraint in this case is policy T4 of the Beer Neighbourhood Plan, uh, which seeks to retain holiday accommodation within uh, the, the settlement and the neighbourhood plan area. Um, it allows essentially for, for two exceptions to this. The first is when the holiday accommodation is no longer viable. Um, the second requires that the proposal uh, deliver benefits to the local economy and community that are greater than or equal to the benefits arising from the current use as holiday lets. Um, so in this case, uh, I don't think a case has really been made in terms of the viability uh, of, of the holiday lets, so that first criteria doesn't apply. The key issue here is, is whether or not the benefits of the uh, proposal in front of you uh, are greater than or equal to the benefits arising from the current use as holiday lets. Uh, officers have sought to assess this in terms of, of the economic benefits and, and uh, our assessment is that clearly through this proposal we would be losing uh, one holiday let in its entirety uh, as that would be incorporated into the residential accommodation of Garlands and a second holiday let would, would be lost. Uh, the benefit uh, of that is that it would put onto the market uh, a new separate dwelling, uh, a two bedroom dwelling. Uh, that we understand the uh, applicants intend to, to rent out, uh, but obviously it could equally be sold off separately. Um, I think the suggestion is that that would help to meet some housing need within the settlement, um, being a relatively small and, and perhaps relatively affordable unit of accommodation compared to uh, other units available within the settlement. Although I should point out that um, house prices are, are obviously very high in beer uh, and it's very unlikely that the property would be rented or sold at a rate that would be affordable as uh, termed in the NPPF and the council's policies in terms of affordable accommodation. Um, officer's assessment notes the views of, of the ward member and the town council, um, parish council. The, the ward member uh, feels that this uh, site is slightly different from uh, the situation that the policy was intended to um, address, which was uh, retaining commercially established uh, holiday let accommodation. Um, and uh, in his comments, he suggests that this is slightly different to being uh, accommodation attached to and related to uh, an existing residential property. Uh, it should be pointed out that the policy T4 um, in the Beer Neighbour Plan does not make that distinction. Um, and so as officers, we're, we're obviously taking a more literal interpretation of the policy. Uh, but we do note the ward member support and, and that of the parish council who have raised no objections uh, to this feeling that the loss of hol holiday accommodation in this case is minor and mitigated by the fact that one unit will become available on the open rental market. Um, as I say, in officers' assessments, there is uh, a significant loss of two holiday accommodation units here. Um, and while we acknowledge that one of those units would be available to let on the open market, um, that in our minds does, does not um, lead to a greater or equal benefit um, to the community arising from the loss of the holiday lets, uh, which is a significant economic loss. Uh, as a result, the recommendation is to refuse the application. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Mr. Freeman. Um, now, you have two statements to read out. Um, I think, uh, Wendy, are you doing those? Yes, I am, Chair. One from Helen Follett, who is the applicant, and one from Councillor Pook. Yes, that's correct, yes. Thank you. Okay. So Mr. and Mrs. Follett's um, statement reads as follows. Mr. and Mrs. Follett would like to thank Ms. Harris for reading out this statement in support of their planning application and make the following points. Gardland, Gardland's house was built in 1910 and was always a residential plot of land originally owned by Devon Clinton Estates. It is not in the conservation area of Beer and is on the edge of the village away from the main 4th Street where the commercial buildings are located. 
there is well suited for holiday accommodation with a high number of houses, second homes and holiday cottages. <coughs> there is a caravan site, a hotel, a pub with bedrooms, a youth hostel, hostel and five bed and breakfast. This accommodation is well utilised in the main season from April to, to September, in brackets, six months of the year, with the other six months very quiet. We feel that to lose two of our three cottages would not significantly damage the accommodation market. The Boathouse Cottage was originally built as part of Garland's house in 1910, so therefore was always residential. We would like to revert back to the original state for residential use. The Seaside Inn, when originally built, was also formed part of the main residential house. They were guest house bedrooms. To reinstate this means simply opening up two existing doorways. We would like to bring this back into our house to have more living accommodation for our growing family. There are no external changes at all. There is sufficient car parking and facilities with no impact on the surrounding houses. If our planning is approved, we would like to be con contributing to the village by continuing to run the beach house as a holiday let. We thank you for the committee's time and consideration in this statement. Thank you, Wendy. And, thank you, and Ward Member Councillor Pook, would like me to read out the following statement. <clears throat> Sorry, excuse me. I support this application, although I acknowledge that the Beer Neighbourhood Plan Objective 19.4 and Policy T4 oppose the loss of holiday accommodation. While the policy could be applied to all accommodation, I feel there should be a different, different between a situation where the accommodation is part of a recognised commercial establishment, such as a hotel or guest house in the main commercial area of the village, and where the accommodation forms a minor part of the main residential accommodation. The loss of commercial establishment would harm the village's tourism infrastructure and would justifiably be opposed. In this case, the owner wants to scale back the holiday let operation and regain space in the main house by reincorporating one unit into the main house. The second unit will be changed to full-time rental residence. While this is a loss to the holiday accommodation stock, it is a welcome and hopefully affordable addition to the general rental housing stock, which is in demand. And to some part, this mitigates the, any perceived harm to tourism. Proposing the conversion from holiday to full-time residence would on other occasions be celebrated as so often it's family homes that are lost to holiday use. One holiday unit is retained, two are lost and one small residence gained. On balance and considering the scale, I believe this is acceptable. Thank you and apologies for not being able to attend the meeting. End of statement. Thank you, Wendy. Right. Well, I see no hands up. Ah, there he is. I knew he'd come in. <laughs> never, never fails to let us down. <laughs> and for the dinner. Well, I mean, we, we've had on holiday accommodations, haven't we? Coming at us left, right, and Chelsea. Um, <laughs> and and, 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 and the, the conflicts that are within them. And, and I, it, it's strange, isn't it? Because as much as you try to throw a policy over this, they are all individual applications. And they are quite complex. They are quite difficult to steer your way through, sometimes some choppy waters. <laughs> and the common sense approach and, and what you think is the right thing to do and balancing that against our policies as to where they sit today. And I don't know how many times my, myself and, and other members have said this today. In, 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 and I think perhaps Chris has probably stored all these up at the same time for a devilment. You know, it's a, that's the way, a way that the cookie cup crumbles. I think on this one on balance, and I very much take on board what Councillor Pook has put in. And no doubt, um, Madam Chair, through you, um, uh, had Councillor Pook had the opportunity to speak today, I think he would have been very eloquent and actually put over the very points that he's laid out 
within this particular documentation. And there's nothing quite like when you're face to face and you see somebody putting those points over. But the points are very relevant. The support of the of Beer Parish being very protective of, of itself in trying to keep residents and not going to accommodation um, and second homes and the like that Beer has suffered for a very long time. And this being a family, let's let's face it, it was a family home and then it changed into what it is today. And now the dynamics have changed and the, and the house has evolved and the families have evolved around it. And it's really fundamentally important that from a human element that we as, as planners, we try to, as a planning committee, we try to not only uh, look at with, with which our policies are and how we balance them against how people live their lives, but there's the human aspect as well. And in this particular application, I'm going to actually go against the officer's recommendation and I'm going to look to have an approval of this. This is not a family that's looking to move out. They're not looking to make financial gain. They're not looking to do anything other than stay within their own home. And as was said before, and a very relevant point was that, that um, the applicant, Mrs. Helen Follett, said in, in the letter read out by, by Wendy earlier, very eloquently I might add as well, Wendy, was that the existing doorways of this house are already there. So this is not something that has just been put up and taken down other previous ones. This is a house and you can see by the very design and the fact of the housing that it is a house and it almost whirls into, into one, if you like. And because of that factor, that overrides for me the fact we're not losing all the accommodation here. We're, the family is evolving. And I think that's a bigger factor than any other aspect that we have here. And it's only the full foul of the policy that we don't have a policy that actually fits individual applications that come forward. And we, this is why we have a planning committee chair. We have a planning committee because we as members are on the ground listening to members, listening to people, listening to the public and trying to react to do the right thing. And in this particular instance, I think doing the right thing is approving this application for all the right reasons. And I see nothing mitigating against what I would consider is the right thing to do. I'm going to leave my comments there. I'll wait to hear whatever others have to say. But my recommendation from the outset is going to be approval to this application. Thank you. Councilor, I'll second that. Was, was that a formal proposal, Councillor Skinner? Because you said you were going to listen. No, I'm going. I'm making the formal proposal to right. uh, uh, approve this application, and I, I am still going to listen, uh, Chair. Okay, thank you. Um, and that's seconded by Councillor Key. Yes. And, and I would like to make the point that because of the number <laughs> of these um, applications regarding holiday accommodation outside the principal holiday accommodation areas, I have asked that this be looked at carefully in the emerging new local plan because it has caused us some dilemmas in the past. Yes. Good Thank and well you. said. Yeah, good, well said, yes. Um, Councillor Key. Yes, thank you, Chair. Um, the thing is, I mean, like this one, I think is totally different to uh, to a lot of them in the fact that this was one large house originally. It has had different parts um, done to it. And I think now with taking part of one holiday let back into it prevents anybody normally would have actually applied to extend the house to have something built onto it. Whereas this one, with the larger family now, can actually make use of one part of it. It's still going to have one holiday uh, unit there, and it's going to have a permanent holiday, a permanent uh, there. Now, it doesn't mean to say that um, that that's going to be. It could be let right throughout the year with being a permanent thing to holiday makers whereas a holiday is limited to the actual um, uh, time that uh, is put on it. So uh, this one, I think, is totally different, and I fully support uh, what Councillor Skinner has said um, in uh, the uh, approval of this application. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Woodward. Thank you, Chair. Um, I think it might have been easier, well, certainly easier for me if this had been a, a split application or two applications. 
Uh, the first where the uh, owners of the property wanting to take one letting back into their residential use, their own use, seems quite clear cut to me. And I can't see why we would want to prevent that. Um, the second part, though, is similar to what we've had before in that um, there's a property which, um, although it mentions rental, as I understand it, and Mr. Rose will tell me if I'm wrong, that could be sold on the open market. Um, so that's the area that we've come across this, um, much today. Um, so that one gives me more difficulty. Um, but on the first part, I would um, go with approval of the first application. Well, what I would regard as the first application. I'll just uh, withhold my uh, decision on the second part to listen to a few more people, if I may. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Davy. Uh, yes, I've got uh, similar uh, comments to Councillor Woodward that um, two uh, applications might have uh, made it easier to uh, distinguish between them. Um, but I think um, we've got to look at the law of unintended consequences here. And if if people who let out part of their house then subsequently find that it's extremely hard to get it to revert back to residential, um, uh, then they may be uh, disinclined in the first place to offer that for holiday accommodation. Um, so I think, uh, you know, we could be landing ourselves with, with a, a problem here. Um, and Ed will recall my uh, mentioning on um, Monday in uh, uh, scrutiny and overview uh, that uh, I would like to see holiday accommodation form part of the um, the. the plan for uh, for that service because uh, I feel it's an important part of our accommodation in the area and um, we need to look carefully at both how we protect it but also how we don't restrict uh, uses. On, on the side of the permanent residential use of the other building I, I accept that that could be sold off although it still forms part of the, the main building and they might not wish to do that. Um, but obviously I can see that a permanent residential use could make more of a, a local economic contribution. Um, so broadly, I would say um, I'm in favour of uh, supporting this application, um, but I shall wait to hear what others have to say. Thank you. <clears throat> Councillor Howe. Thank you. And um, I must admit, I'm sitting here with a bit of a chuckle at present, um, because quite simply, the more we draw up these policies and neighbourhood plans are exactly the same, the more we then argue against them. And that mm -hmm. is the point. We have a neighbourhood plan here that is quite clear cut. This shouldn't be allowed. Yeah. And that has been approved and, and voted through. But from what all the speakers have said, and I agree with them all, this probably should happen, but it's against policy. There yeah. is no vending it. It is against policy. And that's the same as others we're looking at today yeah. at other times. Yeah. The harder we make the policy, the more we'll look to bend it and get round it in the future as well. So we need to make a decision at some point what the mitigating factors are. And, you know, like others have said, you know, it would have been easier if it was two applications because we would have said yes to one and probably no to the other. But we only have one application. Um, and that is the way the planning system is. So we have to take it or leave it. And unfortunately, I think this is just a bit too far. The neighbourhood plan is quite clear cut and I shall be supporting the neighbourhood plan and the residents of Beer in their wishes because they voted on the neighbourhood plan in its words as it stands. So I should do that. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Lawrence. Thank you, Chair. Um, I think there's one um, very distinct point here um, with regard to... Um, the, the, the letting unit. Um, in our previous applications today, um, most of them have, have been turned down on the basis that the site was unsustainable. Whereas this, this, this one obviously is very sustainable because it, it's, it's in or on the edge of, of the town. Um, so I think it is, it is totally different to, to the others that, that we've listened to today. Um, I agree with Mike Howe's comments, uh, sorry, Councillor Howe's comments about um, neighborhood plans and various other things um, and but I also think that this, this one should be allowed we should be able to bend the rules a little bit to allow this one to go through thank you very much 
Thank you. Councillor of the Sarum. Thank you, Chair. Yes, I think this is, this is another very difficult one. And I think uh, Councillor Skinner outlined it quite clearly early when he talked about the human aspect. And, and of course, Councillor Howe reminded us about the policies. Uh, and I think that if we look back again about the policies, if we turn to page 43 of our report, it clearly says, furthermore, there is potential for similar arguments to be made across the parish. And this would undermine the objectives of the tourism policies. So I think it's really important that we protect our tourism policies and we protect our neighbourhood plan policies because these policies are taking a long time to be drafted, many committee sessions, and I think it's very important that we respect what they've said. So I understand the human aspect that Councillor Skinner said, but with great reluctance, I, I would have to support what the recommendation said, uh, which was refusal. So for, the, for those reasons, I mean, I, I understand the human aspect. I, I'm very, very you know, sad to have to say this, but I think we have to go along with the policies that we've been given. Th thank you, Chair. Thank you, Councillor Desarum. And I think we're gonna see more of these in the future. And of course, COVID has changed people's holidaying habits. No question about it. Um, people want to go to the, you know, smaller coastal areas and, and we don't have a policy in place to implement which covers those smaller areas and in fact the rural areas. So uh, it really needs seriously looking at with the new local plan that I've said quite a few times before. Councillor Key. Thank you, Chair. You've just almost hinted on exactly one of the things that I was going to say, because now with this uh, pandemic that we're in, people are actually looking to go on, on holiday at different times of the year now. And this is why this uh, one that we're um, going to uh, lift the holiday let on could do and it could be let all the year round at different times for those people that want to go out of the main holiday season. Mm -hmm. that, uh, and so, but I mean, with regard to somebody mentioned about could be sold off with that very, very attractive house. I do not think that anybody would want to split that and sell any part of it off because it would actually ruin the, uh, the look of that um, dwelling. Thank you. Thank you. Right, there are no more speakers. So over to you, Mrs Shaw, to sum up. Thank you, Chair. Um, members, as you are going for approval contrary to officer's recommendation, could I ask Mr Ed Freeman if he is happy with the reasons for that going against officer's recommendation before we go any further? Um, thank you, Mr Shaw. Um, I, to be honest, I'm not. Um, I, I think um, from the discussion I've heard, I, I think members are, are clear that it doesn't comply with policy T4 of the neighbourhood plan. Um, so I think it would be useful to, to perhaps hear from um, the proposer as to what the materials, uh, exceptional material circumstances are to depart from that policy, um, given that that was... Um, voted for by the community of beer when they uh, had a referendum on their neighbourhood plan and the majority of those voting supported the neighbourhood plan and its adoption, including policy T4. Um, so it'd be useful to understand the reasons for departing from that, that policy, I think, before we go to a vote, if that's possible. Thank well, you. I'll, I'll add a little bit to that through you, Cherry, if, if you don't mind. And of course, yeah. he's Councillor, uh, I'm going to call him Councillor Freeman. Um, uh, Mr. Freeman uh, uh, has uh, made the point about the people of uh, of um, um, beer uh, through their neighbourhood plan, and of course there is a neighbourhood plan that's done. But of course, it's like with all plans and policies, they evolve and they 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 take shape as they go forward, and and they they're viewing the neighbourhood plan and this application both at the same time. And the parish council have done that. They've both viewed it. In the, the comments that Councillor um, Pukas made, is the objective of the plan, he makes it quite clear that that's where they are. But he also goes on to say that the reasoning for the establishment or for the commercial establishment would harm the village tourism infrastructure and would justify that be opposed. But in this case, the owner wants to scale back from the holiday operation and regain space in the house, reincorporating one unit into the main house. So this is a case of going back to the main house. And I would have thought... Um, uh, 
Mr. Freeman, perhaps you may have be more qualified to put the words together as to what that is, because that's the, that's the basis of which uh, we're going uh, we're going forward with this. And I think it's quite right that we can make our decisions and go forward um, on the basis of um, the sort of comments that we make. So on that, taking the, the, the views that um, um, one holiday unit, it was retained and taking the views that um, uh, from what the ward member and the support of the parish council and the parish council have very much supported this and still made reference to the neighbourhood plan, but are still commenting in, in supporting this application. So it's on that basis. And you're more professional at putting these things together than I am, uh, Mr. Freeman. So I might ask you if you could formulate the words around that, that basis. And I'll leave that bit to you. You're the professionals. Hello. Mr. Freeman, are you able to assist members with the wording? Well, the, the, the logic appears to be um, that this is uh, not a commercial establishment um, and therefore that uh, is being used as, as grounds to depart from the policy. But the policy doesn't make a distinction between commercial enterprises and holiday lets that are linked to, to someone's residential home. So... Um, I, I, it's not that I don't have sympathy with what members are wanting to achieve, but I'm, I'm struggling in terms of the policy constraint to understand the reasoning for that decision. Of course, yeah. members are entitled to depart from policy if that's their, their wish, um, but we do need to understand the other material considerations that outweigh the policy. Um, I'm happy to put it into words, but I need to understand the, the general um, uh, well, the material considerations that are outweighing that policy um, in order to, to come up with suitable wording. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Freeman. I'm concerned that we might be opening a floodgate here. Um, we, we could be storing up troubles for ourselves in the future, problems. So... Um... Could, I, could, I just, could I just say something, Chair, in actual yeah. fact? On page 37 uh, there, the parish council say that the committee agreed that the loss of holiday accommodation is minor and mitigated by the fact that one unit will become available on the open rental market, which accords the policy T4 of the neighbourhood plan. So surely that would, that would help as well with uh, one of the um, explanations. Do you have any comment on that, Mr Freeman? Uh, well, if, if members are content that the proposal does comply with policy T4 and that the proposal brings about equal or greater benefits for the local economy than the loss of the, ho the holiday accommodation, uh, then that's, that's fine. Clearly, the reason would be that uh, members consider it complies with policy T4 and is, is in accordance with the development plan. If, if, if that's members' uh, views, then, then that's perfectly acceptable as a reason. You, you well, happy with that, with Philip? That. Yeah, I'll go with that. That was fine. Let's crack on. Councillor Wood, would you want to come back? Well, I was just going to... I had written something down saying that the benefit to the community by providing a modest rental property outweighs uh, the any harm arising from the loss of a holiday let. Um, so that the T4 would be met on that basis. But it's just rephrasing what um, Mr Freeman's just said and uh, Councillor Key. Thank you. Councillor Howe, did you want to come back? Your hand was up, but it's gone again. Yeah, well, I keep umming and ahhing, and, you know, I've just been reading policy T4, and I'm sitting there thinking it doesn't comply. Um, mm -hmm. The parish council are quite clear in that it doesn't mm -hmm. comply with um, the original policy, the, the holiday accommodation, 19.4 uh, objective, um, but they think it will comply with T4, um, but there's no proof of that, you know, um, and, and you're right, Chair, you, in what you said, we are, if we don't identify the reasons why we're going against these policies, we are open door for them all over the place. Yes. Um, and that is the fundamental issue with this. Yeah. We have these policies for a reason. These policies in particular in the Neighbourhood Plan were voted by the locals yeah. for these reasons. And it is really hard to justify in some cases as much as we might like to. Um, but, you know, that's the committee's choice. Um, but they've got to be mindful 
about what they're doing to the rest of the area. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Howell. I've heard you say in the past that we're making policies up on the hoof. And that's exactly what appears to be happening here. There's no point in having a policy if you're not going to stick to it. So I'm, I'm quite concerned about this one. Um, right, that's all the speakers' hands down. Um, can we go to you, Mrs Shaw, please? Thank you, Chair. Yes. Members, you therefore have a recommendation to approve. However, I would ask... Um, if the mover and seconder are happy for the delegation of condition to officers in consultation with the chair, vice chair and ward members. Yes, yes. agree. Yes, Thank agree. You. Thank you, members. Please, when your name is called, would you indicate whether you're in support of the motion to recommend approval, whether you're against the motion to recommend approval or whether you're abstaining from the vote? Thank you. Councillor Bloxham. Support approval. Councillor Brown. Against. Councillor Chamberlain. Against. Councillor Coleman. Against. Councillor Davey. I think in view of the comments I've heard against. Councillor De Serum. With reluctance against the motion to recommend approval. Councillor Gazard. Against. Councillor Howe. Against. Councillor Key. Support approval. Thank you. Councillor Lawrence. Against. Councillor Pratt. Against. Councillor Skinner. Support approval. Councillor Woodward. Support approval. Councillor Rag. Against approval. So that motion to um, approve has fallen, I'm afraid. Thank you. <clears throat> uh, that brings our meeting to an end. And I guess that no. Yes. Oh, hello. I do apologise. <laughs> we. we means then that we have no motion for this matter to be determined. We need to go back oh, to members. Yes. Can I recommend the refusal as per officer's recommendation? I'll Seconded second back. Oh. <laughs> I'm sorry, I didn't get who seconded that, Chair. I did, Chair. Thank I you did. very much. Are you going okay. to move to debate or shall I just go straight? To I don't vote? think we need to. I think enough's been said. Thank you. Therefore, members, the motion before you now, when your name is called, is the refusal for the reasons as set out in the report. Please indicate whether you support the motion to recommend refusal, whether you're against the recommendation to refuse or whether you're abstaining from the vote. Councillor Bloxham. Yeah, I'm against refusal. Against, thank you. Sorry, I had to think for a minute then. Councillor Brown. Or. Councillor Chamberlain. Support motion to refuse. Councillor Coleman. Or refusal. Councillor Davey. Support refusal. Councillor De Serum. Or refusal as per the reasons as set out in the report. Councillor Gazard. Support. Councillor Howe. Support refusal. Councillor Key. Councillor Key. Against refusal. Councillor Lawrence. Support refusal. Councillor Pratt. Support refusal. Councillor Skinner. Against. Councillor Woodward. Against. Councillor Rag. Support refusal. Thank you. So the application is recommended for refusal. Right. I feel a bit like Donkey and Shrek. Are we there yet? And I think we are. <laughs> so um, that brings the meeting to a close. I'd like to thank all officers for all the, the work that they've done both today and leading up to the, the meeting. 
uh, like to thank all you members who, you know, while I might not agree with, with all that you say, um, it's healthy debate. Um, and I'd like to thank members of the public who've been watching and the people who came along to speak today. Um, thank you to everyone. It's been a long, long, quite concentrated meeting. Um, can I remind you members, until the Democratic uh, Services team confirm that the live streaming and recording has stopped, you can still be seen and heard and any comments may, may be re 